Peace, my brother. Can you hear me? Peace, bro. Yes, sir. Yes. Yeah, peace, peace and power to you, family. Peace to you. <laughs> Listen, we're having a little technical difficulties, but we will start in two and a half minutes. Um, I'm just going to put you in the background, and we'll start, we'll start at 105. I just had to switch up my whole computer system. We just have some major issue. All right? Uh, I get it, bro. <laughs> Same thing happened to me a few minutes ago. So I got you. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Peace, peace. We in the building. We in the building. It's been kind of crazy. It's been a trying situation just now. <laughs> I think my other computer basically trapped uh, is crashed or something. I don't wow. know what's going on. I can't even get on, get into the studio with the other computer. It's wow. been a trying day. Yesterday was a hard broadcast, but listen, we're gonna keep pushing forward. Peace, Queen. How you doing today? Peace, how are you? <laughs> I'm all right, I'm all right. We still, still keep moving on because we got yes. a powerful discussion today. So we definitely got to um make sure that this thing is right and exact because, you know, this brother right here, he gave us his time and we definitely want to give time back to him. Absolutely. So anyway, today is 
uh, March 14th, which is the Knowledge Culture Day. Knowledge Culture Day in the Supreme Alphabet is now, nation, or in, which I think is very, very important to this discussion right here. Because right now is the time when either we must build our nation or end our civilization as a people. And we must build this nation to the best of our ability because those that came before us, they gave us the insight to know exactly what we need to do to build. Are we going to pay heed to these ancestors or are we going to drop the ball and just let things continue the way they are going? Peace, Queen. Do you have any announcements today? Well, you know, I, I want to get back to what you just mentioned. Um I don't know. We are we really dropping the ball? Because listen, there's so many people that's out here that's doing great work. So many people in the Harlem community that's doing excellent work. However, I think people are just comfortable at the way things is and just accept anything without doing a research. Um you know, we, we don't have to go to the library anymore. We don't have to pull out the big old brown and red Webster and encyclopedia book no more. We can even be, we can still be lazy and, and say Siri, you know, whatever. So whatever information that we want to look up, I think we are just, we became um, immune to what's going on. And that's really, really sad. You know, um, if I'm not mistaken, uh, one of the sisters out here, uh, Aisha Saku from Street Corner Resources, she had something over on 139th Street yesterday. Um, there was a brother that got killed down on 139th. So, I mean, you know, it's more to just putting candles out. You know, it's more to the to to just boohooing and crying and everybody be unified for that moment. What happens when everybody just happens to, what happens when everybody just walk away? Like, what is the message after that? Um, uh, just a week ago, a young man at the age of 10 was um, pretty much killed um, from his stepfather, if I'm not mistaken. Um, right. alle allegedly, you know, I don't want to just say that's what it is. We don't know the, the whole story. But at the end of the day, like it's too many, too many going, too much stuff is going on, and it's sad. It's very sad. Um, a couple of weeks after that, we we heard that a a, a young lady got killed. Um, Queens, a young lady got killed in her car. You know, mm. uh, you know, back in Harlem, another young lady got killed again. So I mean, we are getting too used to hearing. R.I.P. You know, we heard enough R.I.P. when it was COVID. Every time you turn around, somebody was dying. Now it's R.I.P. because somebody, you know, taking a life. What is the message? So there are great people that's doing great work out here, but are people willing to come out and be unified more than just that hour, that day for the funeral or whatever have you? So what's our next step? So. I'll give it back to you, my king. Yes, yeah, so I've been I've been delving into the brother's material. I must say that I'm impressed. He definitely is a black power revolutionary. So without further ado, <clears throat> I want to read his bio and introduce mm -hmm. the brother onto the podcast. Very powerful brother, very accomplished. Um, so let me read his bio. So the person that we have here today is Professor Carl Tone Jones with a master's in education. Um, Professor Carl Tone Jones, upon obtaining his master's degree in social studies slash citizenship, Professor Carl Tone Jones worked vigorously in the Philadelphia public school system. As a professor, he also teaches courses in the area of community leadership, He's an accomplished lecturer, writer, and public speaker. Jones has taken the task of producing the controversial documentary, The Independence Day Project, which is based on creating a vision of free and independent black community, free of white supremacy. In addition, he is also a published author with a recent book release 
of 2020 through the eyes of a social revolutionary in February 2021. He continues to work with at-risk youth, helping them to develop and utilize critical thinking skills through his workshops and lectures. Jones, who currently hosts the video podcast series Office Af Hours with Professor Carl Tone Jones and Erica Talbert via Facebook, and YouTube, YouTube live every Monday at 9.30 Eastern, co-hosts A New World View with David Barnes on 96.1 FM, 900 AM, and www.wordradio.com uh, every first Sunday of the month at 9 p.m. Eastern time. Jones is also a former host of the Blog Talk radio show from the front porch with Professor Carl Tone Jones. To learn more, email or connect him online ctone one 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 dot cj at gmail.com so without further ado peace my brother oh peace family and peace and black power to you and the queen you know um this is a privilege and honor to um to be amongst uh, amongst such esteemed company man I, I truly um appreciate this the gratitude is just overwhelming right now my gratitude is up too i watched I watched um your uh, Independence Day project, and that project is I must say it's awesome. You had some great speakers on there speaking about some great things. Yeah, well, you know, um, one of the things that uh, that inspired me to make that film was the fact that I had I was going into the schools, and very few people would invite me into the schools um, to speak, to specifically the high schools, after the first time. So I had one particular teacher. Uh, who I had done pri previous work with, and she would invite me into the schools. And one of the things the students would ask me is, well, okay, well, you're giving us all this good information. Now, what are we supposed to do with it? Mm. And then I brought that to a panel of my peers and elders, and I asked them, you know, well, you know, what what um, solutions are we seeking? And every time we started talking solutions, they were just saying, basically, we needed to endure and just, you know, struggle and and, and resist. And I said, well, wait a minute, what about winning? Mm -hmm. And every time we start talking about winning, what would happen is the conversation would typically shift to, well, the white man is blocking us here, the white man's putting obstacles here, the white man's doing this, that, and the other. So I said, well, what if we remove the white man from the equation? You know, mm -hmm. then what would that look like? And a friend of mine came to a lecture that we had here at Black and Nobel in Philly. And um, he said he came to my house afterwards and he said, well, what if we did all that stuff you're talking about? What if we just put it in the movie? And that sort of started sparking the brainstorm. <laughs> it started sparking the, um, the, the concept of putting these things in a movie because I realized what um, with all of the films and all of the history and all the teachings that we've had, we have enough information to understand the system that we're in. But you know, what, what I understood too is that you need to have a vision of what it looks like when you achieve said goal or this, that, and the other. You know, um, when you start to work out, if you're a little overweight, like I was, still am a little bit, but I'm working on it, right? It is what it is. <laughs> so, you know, when you first take a picture of yourself, that first picture, you say, this is the before, you have an idea in your mind of what the after is. You have an idea of what it's going to look like. So, so when I've looked at the, the different types of media that was available, I said, hmm, I watched a lot of the different, the new documentaries that people are, are doing um, these days. And I said, that's a, a great way to uh, re-educate our people. You know, that's a great way because you provide the visuals and some context to it. I said, but the only problem is these documentaries are spending two and a half hours on all of the past history, which is great, but only like five or 10 minutes on what a solution could look like for us. Mm. So I exactly. say, well, let's, let's, so, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. Going, before we get too far into it real quick. We <laughs> <laughs> you know, definitely got to orientate the people onto who you are. So let's, let's just get, a, get into a little background real quick. First, I want to ask you on um, where were you born and raised? Born and raised in North Philly. Um, mm -hmm. Born and raised, uh, I went away to college for about four and a half, five years in upstate Pennsylvania. And um, then I've been back home ever since. Mm -hmm. So, you know, um, just community-based, uh, 
through the Philadelphia public school system. I graduated from Simon Gratz High School, uh, which was notoriously known for a lot of major um, uh, brothers and sisters who went on to achieve some 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 semblance of success. You know, um, Congressman Bill Gray was a graduate of from my high school. Um, but then, you know, I graduated um, with a, prof- a few professional basketball players, most notably Rasheed Wallace. Mm. So, um, you know, um, that's what my school was pretty much known for. But um, yeah, born and raised here and, and um, integrated into the back, reintegrated back into my community, which sometimes can be difficult when you go away to school because sometimes our mindset is just not right for coming back to our home. That's true. That's true. So I would like to ask you. So I see you have a degree in social studies. So what made you choose that field of study? I am a historian, a historian's historian. I grew up <laughs> Like when, when people are talking about like teen, their favorite TV shows, mm-hmm. I was always locked into PBS, mm-hmm. you know, watching the, the, the different um, uh, historical uh, accounts. It's the first time I saw Eyes on the Prize was on PBS, you know, so I was always locked into that. And I was always curious in terms of learning history because within the history um, degree itself, you don't get a lot of good information. But what you do is you get a framework and you say, hmm, well, why does none of this make sense? And you start filling in the blanks. Mm -hmm. And through the process of becoming a historian, I was able to fill in the blanks. And once I became that, I sort of was able to reverse or or reverse engineer, you know, how we got to where we are as black people. Mm -hmm. Now, I can tell you that wasn't like my focus (laughs) because I wanted to be a teacher. Mm -hmm. But um but but when I started learning, you know, it's like um, the matrix being unveiled to you. You can't unsee it now. And I felt as though it was a purpose of mine to um, make sure I brought that information back to my community. It's interesting that you start that you study social studies. I remember social studies when I was coming up in in middle school and high school. I could not stand social studies. <laughs> I did not want to um, engage in that subject. It wasn't just the way that the teachers was teaching, it was the way that it was laid out. It just seemed like a bunch of dates and and Mm. figures and (laughs) people that did not relate to me. Like, I remember getting D's and all of that. I remember, I'm going to tell you something I never told anybody. At sixth grade, (laughs) I had a history teacher. His name was Mr. Mauer. I remember I spit in his coffee because I couldn't stand that (laughs) class. And the whole class, the whole class told on me, and, and he had me in the hole. He was like, how could you spit in my coffee? And I just was looking at him. I was like, <laughs> "Well, you didn't have any soup." So, you know. <laughs> yeah, but like, how, like, how could you like just like get a liking for this subject because it just seems so like dense? I I was always fascinated um, by how story unfolded. I was always mm-hmm. fascinated, and and you know, um, growing up in my neighborhood, you know, Philly is not Philly now is 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 due to gentrification, Philly is diverse. But growing up in the 70s and the 80s, Philly was locked. You know, one community was over here, one community was over there. My community was 99.9% black. The mm. only white people we had in our community um, were the people that owned businesses or our teachers that worked at the school. So other than that, you know, and 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 that's a really important thing to understand too, you know, because when you, talk, when you start talking about, you know, white flight and all that, they left everything. They 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 abandoned these communities from everything else, but they maintained their power grab over the resources in our communities. But mm. um, so going to college, you know, um, and finally settling on history, you know, what I'm saying was uh, it, it was a it, it was a journey. It wasn't like I just woke up that one day and just decided to become a historian. It was just something I naturally gravitated to. And, you know, I, people would go out, party, this, that, and the other. I'm sitting home with one of those little uh, coffee, um, those the, the 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 water boilers that you make tea with. Mm-hmm. And I'm sitting, up till, I'm sitting up pulling all night is knocking out 15 and 16 page papers, you know, but it was wow. fascinating to me because, and, and, and what I take from that now is it truly gave me some insight into how you know, the European mindset is, how they function, how they flow, and then their methods in attacking us, 
you know, mm -hmm. and keeping us off guard because I watched it. If you study their history, they did it to themselves first. <laughs> you know, yeah, I mean, right. we have all terms of all types of terms that we use today, like vandalism, not realizing that was a tribe in Europe that was yeah, going that's around. That's right. Religion, you know, yeah. so, I you agree. know, it, it was, um, you know, I was, it's, it's something I see my orbit, you know, it just, uh, I gravitated to that particular, um, that field. You know, it's funny that you said that about social study. Um, I was getting tired of hearing about slavery all the time. It was just like, okay, I mean, what else did we do besides, <laughs> you know, uh, um, you know, doing things for you or, you know, y'all beating us or whatever. So what else happened, you know? So I wasn't into it as well. I'm, I'm getting into it now because of the people that's around me and, the, and, and hearing different things and reading certain books now inspired me even more so now. But in school, it was just like slave, 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 slave. And Columbia, Columbia, Columbus, he's discovered. And I'm like, what? You know, it was just kind of question mark type thing going on in my head too. It was just, I wasn't, I wasn't too fond of it. <laughs> uh, well, you know, um, and, 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 and I think that's purposeful though. Of course. Because I think that the way history is presented, mm -hmm. if, if it's presented to you in a way where you don't have um, any pride or whatever, and, and you can't look at key historical moments for which you see your ancestors and or people who are still alive as elders contributing to a society that you live in. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that it, it plays a part. So I, and, and, and that's why a lot of us tune out because we don't have no buy-in. There's right. no, there's no reward for, 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 for learning about, um, you know, your people being decimated, your people being defeated. And I think mm -hmm. that's one of the reasons why so many black people run away from calling themselves Africans right now is because as we grew up, we just get story after story, year after year, black history month after black history mm -hmm. month about how we got our behinds kicked, mm -hmm. you know? And, you know, people only want to talk about the victories. That's why when you start talking about white history, they're celebrating, they're, stag they're, they're, they're punching in flags places. You know, they're talking about how they conquered this, they conquered that. It's always a triumphant moment. You know, when we start talking about our history, mm. you know, it's about, you know, well, we were oppressed. Um, we had to overcome adversity. Oh, we've made progress, but we still have so much more to do. And it's not. You know, you don't have one single success story, and the one they don't tell is our biggest achievement is when we should be celebrating every January 1st, and that's 1804, the Haitian Revolution. Mm -hmm. because that's the one right. victory we can point to. But, you know, I taught a class called The Art of Film, and when I went back and did research and the things I would teach my students, it was about the fact that art in itself is propaganda. And when you start learning about that, you start learning about the pictures that it paints. And mm -hmm. you start learning that the first pictures um, of, of black people, specifically Islanders, that were in motion films were that of voodoo zombie under some type of satanic um, mm -hmm. control, necromancy control. And it was the it was, they were actually considered the first horror stories, the first mm -hmm. horror American genre. So mm -hmm. from early on, they wanted to steer us away from our African spiritual systems because mm -hmm. they knew that that was the one time in history they couldn't defeat us with their three, the world's three greatest militaries at the time. You know, you had, um, because before that, America was building up to it, but they weren't quite as powerful as the British. They weren't quite as powerful as um, the, the Spaniards, and, and, and they weren't as powerful as the French. That's right. Know? So when we when you start talking about that and then you, you know, because I take that lesson and then I expand on it and I tell mm -hmm. people, how are you like hanging out in New Orleans? I said, well, you know, New Orleans wasn't if it wasn't for the Haitian Revolution, there would be no New Orleans because there'd be no Louisiana Purchase. Right. Know? Right. So, you know, so that's and when you tie the history into it, it becomes more intriguing. And next thing you know, people start looking into things for themselves. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. For me, for me, um, what got me, um really intrigued about our history and uh our culture beyond what they taught in history class it was hip-hop music you know you had krs1 and rakim and you know it was a song by brand nubian uh where called wake up where grand Poover was um 
Right. I came up in the church, so he had a he had a verse. He said, uh, "Preacher got my aunt to put money in the pan for the rest of the week. Now she's eating out of soup can." Mm. And that that it really that really touched me because I'm thinking about you know going to church and seeing people put money in an offering and spending all of their money in something like that. But for me, that was one of the things that got me really looking introspectively into our community. But if you could pick a moment in your life, what inspired you to focus on the black struggle and the black agenda? Um, real quick, I want to touch on what you just said though about the church. <laughs> <Because> I have- <laughs> but I didn't need no I didn't need any, I didn't need to hear it from hip hop. Um, I was actually str- you know, my family was struggling. You know, we had three gen- three, four generations in the house and um putting pits and pennies together, putting a collection plate. And one day we um uh, I was 13. I'll never forget this day. My aunt and I and my sister were walking out of church and we caught the deacons and the pastors and everybody divvying up the money from the collection plate. I was mm. so turned off by that. I never, I, it took me, it literally took me, I'm thinking, it look, took me about 25 years to go back to a church after that. Um, but, mm. Mm. Wow. So, so when, you know, um, my mm. first real, um, cause I've always been about um, black empowerment, but I didn't truly understand what white supremacy was. So I'm thinking black empowerment was just more so, you know, speaking up for yourself as somebody black, speaking this, that, and the other. It wasn't until I started, um, honestly, um, surely just focusing, because I've always had it, but it's just, my focus wasn't there. I started really putting the pieces to the puzzle together, you know, about, um, about 11 years ago, honestly about, um, because I've always been about working with the kids, working in the community, giving back, this, that, and the other. So I thought when I was teaching, I was giving back. I thought when I was working in schools, I was giving back. I really did not understand white supremacy until Mm -hmm. then, you know, and I had stumbled across, I I stumbled across um, some videos because I was Mm -hmm. doing research for one of my classes and I stumbled across some videos and one of the videos, I think it was like Dave Chappelle Mm -hmm. and Dave Chappelle had an interview at the Actors Guild. And he started talking about how black men in particular were, you know, how it seemed as though that Hollywood was purposefully making it where, you know, they were effeminating black men. They were always making mm-hmm. them wear have them in homosexual uh, uh, roles on camera. And after I looked into that and I started dealing with some people and um, dealing with some of the groups because social media was pretty much, it wasn't as wide, as wide cast as it is right now. But I started having conversations with some brothers and I started looking at a lot of videos and I give the brother credit, you know, for, for helping me get here because I was watching Dr. John Henry Clark. Um, I was watching some of the old Amos Wilson videos. Um, and when I saw, uh, oh, and Steve Coakley, right? <laughs> but when I saw, I think that was a video of a, a Philly brother, uh, Umar Johnson. Mm-hmm. And I saw him, uh, it was a, a video that he did here in Philly, um, at, ironically, a Black and Nobel. Um, when he when he did a video here in Philly um, talking about what what President Obama meant to black people, it really took me aback because I felt like because before, you know, I was just going with the flow, going with this whole idea about having a career, this, that and the other. But when I started looking at that, I said, damn, you know what? And I started looking at the conditions that I was that I was living in. I started looking at the downward um, trend that was happening with, you know, uh, the young people in our uh, around my neighborhood. Who are getting caught up and strung out and and getting into the street life and i'm looking around i'm saying damn there's nobody here but pimps hustlers and excuse my french whores so all these kids are seeing is this so that's all they have to look to when they come out the house and mm-hmm. i said we got something better for them you know what i'm saying so um we we have to be we have to be the vision of what they see in themselves, mm-hmm. you know? So, uh, <clears throat> so, because I remember growing up around here, I remember when there were black doctor's offices. I remember then when there were black owned corner stores and supermarkets, shoe shops, dry cleaners and things of that nature. I remember that. And the only thing we sat, have right now are barbershops. And mm. we started soul food restaurants back. But right now barbershops and hair salons are what we're, you know, holding on to. So. Looking at all that, I said, damn, I need to do something because my life can't be empty. I had two young nephews at the time. Um, they're grown now, but that they were young. And I said, I can't leave this world in a way for them so that they have to deal with some of the things that I deal with today. 
we have to create a situation for them. And then it really exploded when the Trayvon Martin mm-hmm. incident occurred. So when Trayvon Martin was murdered, that was actually my first public lecture outside of a high school or whatever at Black and Nobel Bookstore uh, when it was located in North Philly. Mm-hmm. Um, and breaking down how George Zimmerman got away with it, breaking down how the system was set up to allow him to get away with murder, mm. um, how they created uh, a, a court system similar to, uh, I don't know if y'all fam- if y'all familiar with that movie, um, geez, I can't remember it, but I do remember um, it um, had some, some famous, like an all-star cast, and it was about these kids who had gotten in trouble for, um, for, for causing an accident with a food cart and they all went away to this home and in this home they were molested by the guards and then Ooh. after they got out of the home they you know started killing off the guards and Brad Pitt was like the the prosecuting attorney but mm-hmm. he fed you know um he he fed all the information to the defense team I mean to the um defense attorney and they were able to basically you know create a a, a scenario or a a fictitious case or fictitious um, court scene where they pretended like they were really trying to seek justice, but basically it was about getting this man off. So Hmm. that's what I saw with the Zimmerman case. And I saw Hmm. that and I I broke it down. And from that point forward, I became immersed in what you would call now um, black consciousness. Gotcha. Wow. So I'm a picture of your... um... We did watch that one on YouTube um, when you was, uh, I think, in the school area. Okay, <laughs> yeah, which one? Mm-hmm. Oh, right, exactly. Um, he yeah, we was, a professor. He got to always yeah, be. In school yeah, yeah, that's true. Um, oh my goodness, we was watching so many yesterday um, yeah, on we, YouTube. Mm-hmm. We was watching a lot of your history on YouTube. A lot of the videos, seven, four, three, two years ago. We watched the Independence Day Project, which is on the screen now, the Independence Day Project. I think it's an excellent project. Yes. So, um, you want to ask the next question? Yes. So, I mean, I was I was able to actually sit and be one of the persons in the audience to watch it from <laughs> Red Deer at the State Building. And it was really, really inspiring. So I want to ask you, like, what inspired you to cur- curate? the independence project and what is it? So break that down for our people before we play a little bit of it. Okay. Um, Well, like I said earlier, uh, the uh, inspiration behind it really was to create a vision. You know, um, I looked at it like, uh, like we were talking about the body fat thing and working out, but I also look at it like, um, we we keep talking about something. um, and, And when I see us talk about building, it's always grassroots from the ground up. And that's cool, but what tends to happen is part way through that, some partial way through that, we sort of lose our way because we don't have a concrete vision of what it is we want to achieve. And I saw I, I attributed, I, I look at it like uh, say, um, Google Maps, right? <laughs> Google Maps tell you, and, I, and I'm not trying to give them any endorsements because they ain't paying this, but um, <laughs> if you want to go somewhere, like if I was to come to New York and it was a part of New York I'm not familiar with. I would need to at least have an idea about the destination, how much time it's going to take to get there, how much gas is it going to take and what it's going to look like when we finally arrive there. You know, I attribute it also to like um, when we started talking about um, this so-called great race to space. It really was an arms race, but they couldn't tell people it was the great. Um, it was an arms race because people wasn't too keen on spending money with the military. So, in the late forties, fifties, and sixties, when they started, you know, sending rockets up in space, what they were doing was creating. They 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 started putting out television shows like and, and cartoons like Flash Gordon. They started talking about you know in the cartoons talking about uh, men from I mean uh, different men from Mars. You had the World of Worlds and all this other stuff, and you were creating a, a genre a, a competition using science fiction to put to promote science fact and. So what they ended up doing was they created a global competition to get people to um, to inspire people to put different rocket, better rocket de- designs and more efficient fuel uh, methods together to get to space. And so they were able to achieve that by by putting the vision out there first, similar mm-hmm. to what they're doing right now, where they're talking about occupying Mars, you know, um, yes. the vision out there first. So I said, well, well, what we need to do as a people 
we need to put the vision out there as to what a liberated black community, free of white supremacy would look like. So I called all the smart people that I knew, because you know everybody that's in the film is smarter than me. So <laughs> I called all my people that I knew, and I said, well, what, what, do you, what, what would that look like to you? And I'll be honest, the first time I asked the question, none of us really had an answer. Mm -hmm. You know, it's something that was a new concept. We were mm -hmm. used to, you know, um, to studying the history, uncovering the lies. But, you know, um, if you even look at Dr. Amos Wilson, the blueprint to build black power, he does not say too many things different than what we put in the film. But mm -hmm. you're not going to be able to read a 900 page book. Yeah, I'm not going to lie to you. I still haven't read the whole thing yet. <laughs> so, you know, and me too, I figure I go, I go and I get section at the section, you know, but the bottom line is people, when they see the visual, the visual can become the reality. That's so that, true. that was the, the intent with the Independence Day project. Um, and, and shoot, if I had more resources, you would have seen graphics and, and, and animations and all this, that and the other. But, you know, we had to do that from the wrist. Um. Being that you said that, you know, you said you had a lot, you got a lot of people who you feel are smarter than yourself, but you're a very smart man, so I find that hard to believe. But anyway, <laughs> um, you know, a lot of times we have a lot of our people out here that are all working in silos. Like, mm -hmm. how did you get all of these people to come onto this project and to buy into the project and to and to collaborate with you on, on such a great project? Um, I think they all saw the vision. Mm -hmm. I think all saw the vision and in one way or another we're working towards that i mean y'all um mentioned on um, the brother q butter with zyac studios you know um we actually did some shooting in there and mm. one of the things that was impressive was how efficient zyac studio is i don't know if people realize you got a um radio studio you got like a, a recording studio you got um they got like a a, a, a photography studio they got wow. a bar Shop. They got a community center, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And it's they in got Brooklyn, right? Yeah, in Brooklyn mm -hmm. on um, St. Mark's. Mm -hmm. So, you, you know, um, um, in St. Mark's, right off, right Saint on Mark. Saint Mark's. Okay, St. Mark's, all right. Mm -hmm. So, um, it's like about 10 blocks off Atlantic Avenue. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, but when you saw that, that's 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 somebody looking for freedom and independence. You know, brother I.J. Tayemba with Harlem Liberation School, Black Liberation University. I mean, the word liberation is in the title. Mm -hmm. You know, um, in the pro in the community programs that you have going on, I had a sister who um, out in California, one of my favorite people in the world, Kara Poole, who um, created a, a video series called The Great Grio, where she was yes. little. <laughs> I watched yeah. it. Yeah, she she she's she's just di a dynamic person with a mind that is like beyond comprehension. My brothers in um, Florida and uh, well, they're both Florida native, Tallahassee natives. You know, my brothers um, Joseph Ward and uh, Patrick Irvin. You know, two of the sharpest young minds. You know, in this particular area, and 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 when we pull all these people together, and I didn't mention I've got people here in Philadelphia, the Philadelphia Peace Park, where they're trying to. Uh, cultivate land and claim it and do reclamation of it and turn it into food sanctuaries and and and, and alleviate food deserts. You know, we got a lot of smart and sharp people that are working on the project that 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 had that mind saying, you know what, this is what I wanted. But and 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 they were looking forward to becoming part of the 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 process in terms of of doing this. So getting them to do it wasn't hard. <laughs> well let's you play know, let's play a, a quick clip. Let's just play a quick clip if you don't mind. No, sir. Okay. No. okay. Yeah, it was really inspiring when I did see it. And then um we watched it again last night. Well, this morning. Yes. <laughs> can you hear it? Yes, yeah, we can hear it. Okay. You know, even with us understanding culture, right? I had a friend who said something to me that was very profound. He said, you know what? Not everybody's meant to be a warrior. Not everybody's meant to fight on the front lines physically. Everybody's not designed to be a warrior. Even in their military system, not everybody's designed to be a warrior, which is why you see people come back home and mentally they can't handle it. Um, it destroys their life a lot of time because they can't handle what they've had to do, what they've seen done over there because everybody's not meant to be a warrior. 
And I thought about that thing even further. I said, you know what? Not everybody's even meant to be some intellectual reading a ton of books to understand and make sense of this system that we're in. We're not yoked into what we are as a people. So therefore we become parts of subsets. We can understand that culture can be shaped in this modern age, not only by natural occurrences, but also by the decisions that we make and the experiences and the environments that we choose to put ourselves in. So there's an African proverb that says, power must be handled in the manner of an egg. Handle it too firmly, it breaks, too loosely, it falls. And I think that um, our issue right now is that we have mishandled power. We have, uh, we have not promoted or put forward responsible power from a black and African centered perspective. We have not created power that we could resist European and white supremacy incursion. And we are not using the power of courage and imagination to create a future for a powerful future for black children. Wow. So that's a, this video is definitely a powerful video. We gotta um we gotta bring this more to the forefront. I don't know if like like the average person, you know, because I don't want to say I don't want to say average person like it's a bad thing. I'm just saying, like, you know, <laughs> the, the people that are just out there just chilling they're not really digging into history they're not really digging into culture how do we get that that um the 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 concepts that's involved in this documentary how do we get that to them well, that's, that's a good question because we've been trying <laughs> for the last three years but um i think that mostly uh it, it's it's going to come at a point where it depends on which audience we're going for now because mm -hmm. As and it's funny because you know, um, for anybody watching, we didn't we didn't rehearse this and we didn't go over talking points to say any other. <laughs> so it was amazing that a few of the people I just mentioned were in that clip, um, along with my good brother, um, Eric Keith Grimes, um, brother Shamari, who um, also hosts a radio show here in Philadelphia on WRD. But um, one of the things that um, I like to I would like to do is to get it in front of more mm -hmm. action ready people and that's mm -hmm. the young typically and, and i hate to say it, but that's the younger people because you know um whether we want to admit or not i'm in my mid-40s i'm closer to 50 than i am 40. <laughs> and and so you know those days of, of being uh out there in the streets front lines this that and the other those days are dwindling down mm -hmm. when we look at um when we look at our history and we look at the people who had to fight in them you know, we're talking about 16, 17 year olds. I mean, Fred Hampton, well, a lot of the videos we see, Fred Hampton was 16. And a lot mm -hmm. of those videos we saw. Young you know? smart brother, for real. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know? So, and, and was murdered at the age of 21. Right. You know? No, excuse me, assassinated. That wasn't a right. murder, that was an assassination. Mm -hmm. assassination. Mm -hmm. 21. So, uh, that that just shows you that that's the age you know the panthers even if you want to go back to the civil rights movement the people the younger the people the the better it is to get them engaged but they also have to be culturally ready so mm -hmm. it's like it's like a two-part piece to it we have to balance both ends we have to create a culture and protection where they're safe enough for expression and then we have to cultivate them because they're the warriors mm -hmm. they're the ones that are going to change the the landscape for black people in this planet on in, on these lands today They're, that's who we have to deal with and i think one of the biggest problems is when we try to have these gatherings and conversations it becomes like a uh, exclusive club where um we don't necessarily exclude anybody but we don't invite people who are not um part oh, of, of course that. yeah right. <laughs> so mm -hmm. We, we, we have to get the message in front of the younger people and then not necessarily scare them away. <laughs> right. I, I've, seen, I've seen too many times when the young folks got up and they start speaking, they're full of vigor, ambition, and we shoot them down, mm -hmm. like, like, like um, basically putting them in their place. And then they don't want to come back to that. It's and so true. Taking that energy and cultivating it and say, hey, well, you know what? Let's 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 start over because we have to realize too how broken the community we are mm -hmm. so 
Mm-hmm. We are, and if, if if 2020 didn't show us anything, it showed us how ravaged we have become just based on the the, the our mental health in the Instagram. Hold, hold that, hold that. Don't get don't get into 20 because it's something I want to yeah. add. We do about, have questions, and yeah, you're going right into about that. <laughs> so I keep getting ahead of myself. <laughs> yeah, but we had we recently had a panel. We recently had a panel on called Bridging the Gap, and before that, we had a Rites of Passage panel. And you know, one of the things that 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 consistently come up is this gap between the elders and the youth. Right. And you know, we, we 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 consistently try to bridge this gap. People have teen summits out here, they have these panels for the youth, and so and I keep seeing the same paradigm where it seems like the elders is overpowering the youth, and mm-hmm. maybe it might be one or two, three youth there, and it becomes like an interrogation, and the youth don't have a chance to really, you know, um speak their mind themselves, mm-hmm. speak their mind the way that they would in, in, in front of their peers. So right. I think that's something that's very important that we have to do. And the, the language is different. Like when I had my um, teen panel, I allowed my host, which is a teenager, to host it. You know, I, I gave him the questions, <laughs> but I was just there for the, the moral support. You know, anything can happen. We could have tech issues, but I was just there for moral support. And he just asked the questions. And I just stayed... In the background, you know, I, I anytime when there was a gap, I would like push the youth like, hey, so what do y'all think? You know, but otherwise that we have to change up the narrative because their language is not our language. And and we gotta understand that and appreciate them. Let when when we start having these teen summits, let the youth let the youth go ahead and do what they gotta do. Let them host it. We are just there to support them because one year we was at a teen su- summit and they got on one of the brothers so hard. And I was like, damn, I, I, I wish I could hug the young brother because he felt like he was battling with, with us. Right. And that wasn't that wasn't that that wasn't that's not what we came there for. We came there to support. But he, you know, just felt some kind of way. And I understand I did, he I got defensive. No yeah, oh, you did. He, yeah, I he did. became get- very defensive. So, <laughs> you know, we, we got to learn how to um, shift it and let them go ahead and do their thing as well. So, yeah, well, <clears throat> one of the things I see is that in that particular void is the elders who've been through some things. They've been there and now, you know, they need therapy. Mm-hmm. We all mm-hmm. need therapy. The community mm-hmm. needs to heal. So basically, you know, and, and, and let's let's be real. <laughs> we know that when we attack each other, that the collateral damage is manageable. Mm-hmm. We know when we take that energy to who deserves that energy, that they'll drop a nuke on our block and mm-hmm. not think of it, get away with it, won't be prosecuted or anything. So, you know, one of the things we have to start doing, well, I'm not going to say one of the things we have to start doing because it's being done. But we have to really cultivate being jagnas to the young people mm-hmm. and allowing them to to become um, and to their and then to their own because what their future is going to represent, we don't know. We we have to start realizing too and, and start having some reflection of our own lives. When I was um, 16, 17, I thought I knew some stuff. When I was 18, <laughs> <We all> did. <laughs> I thought I knew a lot. When I was 25, I thought I knew everything. And right. when I 35, I realized I ain't no shit. Excuse my language. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. <laughs> Family it's <so> program. True. <laughs> yeah, you know, and, and, and I had to re sort of like restart that whole process. I learned what I learned. That's why one of the things we talk about in the, in the Independence Day project is divorcing ourselves from their culture, their rituals, their traditions, and all of their teachings. Because once we start to do that, then we can sort of, you know, clean that slate and then put our information in proper context into our um into our reality and then take that and and when you do that you have a more humble nature a lot of our elders are bitter angry they had dreams and, and they thought that they were going to change the world i thought i was going to change the world um i'm not and i'm not leaving that alone but it's not happening the way i thought it would mm-hmm. and a lot of people have you know they're looking at it and, and, then, and then you look at the conditions 
-hmm. you know, and from the young person's perspective, they're looking at it like, man, listen, y'all can say what you want, but you did not create a world for us. And mm. you did not create, and you did not instill in us what we needed to survive to this point. And you don't have the resources to do it now. So who the mm. hell are you talking to? And wow. <laughs> it's like a, an absentee parent showing up on your 18th birthday, like I'm your daddy. Stop. <laughs> <laughs> or your mama. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. You know? Mm -hmm. so, um, so you you highlighted <laughs> that term. You spoke about that term in the um in the Independence Day project, the Jegna. Now, I had previously learned about the griot, but now they're saying that the griot is not really an African term. It's more of like a Greek term um, in, in its um, etymology. But the jegna, that's a term that's specific to African culture. Could you, like, flesh that out a little bit? Yeah, it's an empiric term, and um, and we believe it started in, in, in the area where you would call Ethiopia today. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it speaks to somebody that you hold in esteem, a person that's good character, good nature, good model, role model for the community, a person that's upstanding, a person that, you know, a good teacher. It, it has all of the things that we think mentor has, but it doesn't have any of the negative Greek connotations that come with that because the term mentor, even though there's some 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 studies that mentee was um was the uh, abridged version of mentor and that was that indeed was african but the mentor that we the type the way we use it is similar in nature to how the greeks used it and the roman catholics used it when they would send a young male to become an apprentice with an elder while the family or the father was off at war and many times the young male became he was molested by mm. in the process so you know to not tie in because words have power mm -hmm. to not consistently use those words um to use the words that, that give us power the words that re that reinvigorate our culture we you know me when i teach people the word jagna is is re, is used to replace that because once again we're rewriting our own history we're removing ourselves from their cultures their rituals and traditions and we're replacing them with our own there you go. I like you that. Crushed, you just crushed my whole nonprofit because the the first word of non nonprofit acronym is mentor. So now, so now, <laughs> now we may have to change our nonprofit because our nonprofit is mentors against drugs and guns through experience. So now I don't know if we might have to reword that. But let's. I mean, we are in a new space, right? I understand that. You know, we do want to look forward. I mean, we want to look back to go forward. But right now we're in a new space. We cannot go back specifically to um, the times of Mansa Musa or the times of, you know, Komet or the times of Great Zimbabwe and so forth and so on. Um, I'm going to cut it off right there, brother. We can't even go back as far as Malcolm. That's right. True. Yeah. I mean, we could take the ideology, but we can't. Uh, the world we live in right now is nowhere near what the world he lived in. And the fact that the things he's saying are still relevant today mm -hmm. uh, uh, with, um, uh, you know, um, Carter G. Woodson and what he said in the miseducation of Negro, that those things mm -hmm. are relevant. Today, it means we need to do something to to deal with the current programming that, we, mm -hmm. that we're facing right now. And you're right. Going back and just staying there is not working. Oh, absolutely. Right. That's the problem, you know, and, and I believe my model to when I'm watching a lot of these history um shows i see how they um scare scare us <laughs> mm -hmm. so it's like yeah you have a dream but then at the end what happened so anybody mm -hmm. who has a dream being crushed uh, uh uh you can't get that far you we're not gonna allow you so this is what i'm saying when you mention people would say the white man this is what they see this is what they see. Um, you try to own your own business. Uh, we have our own businesses at one point. What do they do? Burn it all up. Mm -hmm. You know, um, what can we have without including them? Or what can we have? It is is totally different now, and it's so sickening. It's aggravating. You know, um, we have a lot of people that talk or have uh, <laughs> programs. 
and there's no real solutions. It's just, what else can we do? You know, I'm even thinking about starting up. Um, I even thought about starting up a business susu, a business susu. So how about we take some money, help one person, and then turn around that person. We could buy into that person. Then we could turn around it. And, and I, I mean, I had the whole thing laid out. And when I was uh, um, forming the uh, the Zoom the discussions, I had everything planned out. Nobody showed up. Mm-hmm. Business yeah. susu. <laughs> We're so, real comfortable so, where we are, unfortunately. Before you answer that, let me just ask you the two-part question so that you can fill your answer with it as well. All right? Okay. And I'm going to combine in two questions. So the first question is, if the African community we once left no longer exists, do we have to adjust or evolve to thrive in this new world order? Mm. And secondly, with the amount of globalization at this point, do you think we will ever truly be an independent black community? Well, I know we could be. We uh, could. <laughs> so the answer to both of those questions, you know, in terms of being a part of the 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 new world order, because I agree, that's what that's what we just experienced. We we experienced an abrupt shape, a change in the polarities, you know, and it happened fast. And 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 with all the distractions and stuff going on behind going on out in the world behind the scenes, that's actually what they did. Mm-hmm. But so in terms of using it, well, I think it's a that's a really complicated question because I yeah. think we can use their tools to still build what we need. Mm. You know, um, when when they're building corporations and, and they're building their Fortune 500 companies, they don't mind plucking the best, the biggest, and the best, brightest ideas from us stealing, plagiarizing, and all that other stuff. Where I think we kind of like missed the ball at is we don't think that we can snatch their resources and use them for our benefit. So. You know, we start getting into this. Well, I don't want to be a capitalist. I don't want to do this. Well, I'm sorry, but that orange over there costs two dollars. Are you going to eat it or not? So mm-hmm. that's capitalism. You know, mm-hmm. we have to be more dynamic. And this is one of the things we talked about in the film is we need to have think tanks. So think tanks can answer these questions because that's too big of a concept for one or two people to grip. You need people who this is their full time job to analyze, crunch numbers and to put us in the best position possible to achieve these goals. You got the Rand Corporation. You got all these other corporations, the Stanford Institute. You got all these corporations. When I did this assignment for my class, we ran down a list. It was about 50. 50 think tanks, multi-million dollar think tanks just here in America, you know, um, where they, if it's about banking, it's about community solutions, if it's about um, environmental causes and things of that nature, they have a think tank for everything. And we mm. are, just, you know, trying to, like, like sis, sis, get on a Zoom call, have a conversation, and then you got people, so if that's not their full-time job, now you got children running around the house, you got, mm-hmm. you know, um, you got to feed the pets. Oh, y'all lucky y'all haven't seen my cat jumping on things in here today. You know, um, sleep. all I can't do is sleep, eat, and, and the other thing that mm-hmm. I don't want to say. I, well, I don't need to feed my cat with y'all feeding y'all. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but she thinks she's a, she thinks she's um, bat girl up in here. But, <laughs> The uh, but but so to answer the question is it's a complicated question because yeah we need to use the things that that are relevant you know um with the stimulus packages that are coming out a lot of people are getting hung up on the the materialistic uh, well well the, the stimulus check itself mm-hmm. but not the resources behind it because mm-hmm. you can add all that, the fourteen hundred dollar checks up all you want. But the real resources is behind what they're putting into these small businesses because they realize that you can't have uh, an America without a middle class. And mm-hmm. so what they're doing is trying to give their people opportunity using dog whistle language in these particular documents that will scare us off from dealing with it. So I'm dealing with brothers and sisters right now that are teaching other black people on how to get that money to build resources for their people. So, I mean, even I am involved in that process right now and, mm-hmm. and and I can't, you know, and I can get, I can't deal with the, with the brothers and sisters who say, you know, that's the white man this is the white. Listen, right now, the reason why our young people, the biggest reason why they don't listen to us is because we can talk what we talk, but when they walk outside in in Brooklyn, when they walk outside in Harlem, when they walk outside anywhere else, they can look at all of the big brick and mortar companies, skyscrapers, skylines, this, that, and the other, and realize we don't own none of it. Greetings. Mm. My name is Chanel. That's so, that's crazy. I am. So we have to 
get to the point where we become resource rich. You can't have a community. I was talking to Professor Smalls a few days ago. And mm -hmm. one of the things we always talk about is the build of the foundation. We have to really, you know, there's a there's a um a pyramid called Bloom's Taxonomy, a chart. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah if we don't fulfill the bottom part of that chart, where you provide resources, mm -hmm. where you provide food, before, before you provide I listen, how is it that are not that have not um come across that you have to break down exactly what Bloom's taxonomy is, real Bloom, quick. <laughs> yeah, Bloom's taxonomy is 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 the model for which any civilization is built, any society is built. If you want to maintain it, and it goes on several levels, the first level is the basics. We talk about the resources and the stability piece, you know, food, this, that, and the other. Then when you start going up and higher to go, it's, it's about the evolution of that, that, that community. So you start talking about um, not just the resources now, now you start talking about the spiritual systems, you start talking about the economic and environmental systems that you put in place to protect it. In the end, you have what is considered an enlightened community because now you start having people with thought processes and they're interjecting their ideas, their, their religions, their cultures, this, that, and the other. And then that's where they take it and build it and grow. So Christianity started off that way. Islam started off that way. Judaism started off that way. Every society, communism started off that way. Capitalism started off that way. Everything we have, so Socialism started off that way. Everything mm -hmm. you see in the world started off that way. And we were the first ones to do it. So it's mm -hmm. not a European concept. This is what I say. They take from us and then take it and turn it into their own. You know, this is the, why they the, study us. Identifying right. pie, that's the pyramids, mm -hmm. you know. <laughs> right. But they call it Agram's theory. You know what I'm saying? Right. They steal from us. M Hotep was the creator, master scientist, creator, builder, all those different things. Well, that's why you see the medical staff has the two snakes on it. That's the representation okay. of African-centered right. medicine, you know? Right. So, you know, we, we, we have, so, so when we start talking about um, those things, the basic, the bottom part is we have to be to provide the resources, the, the security, the food, and the ability for people to make their own money and housing. You provide those things for people, they start to listen to you. That's one of the reasons why the Panthers would feed the children in the morning. The Panthers would put open clinics in the community and they weren't even, they weren't even a race first organization. They were class, they were class first organizations. They talk about classism and things of that nature, but they did the majority of their work in our communities. So, mm -hmm. but, but so that's I, what made them America's number one target, America's mm -hmm. most wanted. I had a chance to read your book. I, I got your book on Kindle, and I want to talk about that. Well, let, let us just go off to a quick break, and then um, uh, we'll come back and we'll talk about the book. All right, give me one minute. All right, sure. Greetings. My name is Shanice Gaywood Ali. I am the CEO and founder of We Are Phenomenal Women. We Are Phenomenal Women is an informative, empowering group that connects, educate, and support women who have experienced domestic violence in the past or could experience in the future. Coming into our world, our four podcast, I will speak your mind podcast with the Ali's. Thank you so much for um, being a part of this with us. Thank you. Thank you for the advertisement, sir. Well, you know, you got you know, <laughs> to promote, promote the beautiful things that you were doing in the community. You know, this thing, this thing is, this thing is a long time coming. Um, but let me show this. Okay, can you see that? Yes. Yes, sir. So, yes. Let's get into this right here. Now, yes. this thing right here. <laughs> I read this thing this morning and, and a couple days ago I've been reading into it, reading it, reading it. And I think that, you know, you definitely put some poignant things 
in this book. Okay, so you want to ask the first question? So 2020, through the eyes of social media revolution, revolutionary, excuse me, please break that down to us. The title, break that down. So we've been like, um, there's been like a um, a real um, battle between uh, people who are grassroots organizers, people who identify as boots on the ground, and then you know, you have people who um, do a lot of their work through their social media platforms. And I'm one of those people that do both. You know what I'm saying? So when I came up with the title um, and, I, and I wrestled with it for a while because I didn't want to be identified as just the ones with the Twitter fingers or um, the ones that, you know, um, hide behind the keyboards or um, Facebook or Instagram or whatever. But what I really tried to delve into is the fact that these things that I would do with social media were reflections. They were my reflection. And on social media, they these particular conversations were these particular conversation starters, I would say, they generated a lot of interest from a lot of people. Some of them went viral. So I uh, came up with the title. I thought about um, what was going to be the basis of the book. And the basis of the book is to talk, speak to uh, what I was dealing with, my personal struggle, my personal battle, my personal walk through 2020. And I consider myself to be a revolutionary, but I'm also utilizing social media. And the more I look at it, 2020 became the year where we were really placed with social media sort of took center stage. It, I mean, it had a place before, but social media, content creators, all those different things, social media became the basis for which we, we shared information. So that went into the title. I wanted people to see that this was the, this was, these were reflections through my eyes of 2020. So thus we have the title um, 2020 through the eyes of a social media revolutionary. Mm. So you spoke, you spoke in the book about people thinking that 2020 would be a great year. All of this 2020 vision. Everybody was hyped about 2020. Like this sure. be that year. <laughs> everybody was super hyped. So do you think that people refuse to see the true vision, right? Mm -hmm. Of our plight in America when 2020 turned out to be not what they thought it would be, but what it really was. Mm. Yeah, well, I thought that um, because there were parts of 2020 that were great for me and parts that wasn't. But I think we tend to look at things through rose-colored lenses. So when we start talking about projections, futures, business, and things of that nature, we start thinking about all the great things that can come from it. But that, in, in reality, that's not a true vision. That's a wish list. Um, a true vision takes the good with the bad, and it also provides you with clarity. And I thought that um, a lot of us just, I thought a lot of us went into 2020, you got to really think about these last couple of years, specifically economically, there was been a lot of struggles. 28, mm -hmm. I could go back to 2017, 2018, 2019. And every year people are like, this is going to be my year. So mm -hmm. when 2020 came out, <laughs> I saw myself included. I'm included in that bunch that thought 2020 <laughs> was going to be, you know, 2020 was going to be where we hit our mark. So when when 2020 came and um, and I started the year as sick as a dog, when mm. I started, um, I started. I can think back to December 19th because that's the day we had a viewing here in Philly. That was like the first day I started feeling some symptoms, but I really felt like I had. I don't know if I had the coronavirus or what, but I felt sick and it was for like six weeks that, mm. um, that I was under. And so my year started off like that, <laughs> but. Um, I think that people couldn't really accept it because we didn't want to. We mm -hmm. want we, we and it, it, it's hard being black. Let's just be real. We are, you know, even though we ourselves are dealing with our current life and lifespan experiences, we still carry, you know, um, the burdens. We still carry the the um, the issues, and we still carry a lot of the weight of our people in our community. And this is hard to wake up every day feeling like, damn, I got to fight. I got to fight. I got to fight just to breathe. I got to fight just to walk down the street. I got to fight just to get a job. I got to fight just to get on the bus. I got to fight just to just sit on my steps. Just and be heard. Yeah, <laughs> period. So when, you know, um, 2020 came, I think a lot of people was just looking for a way to catch their breath. And, right. I, and but 
honestly, I think what happened in 2020 was probably some of the most um, enlightening um, things that, that we could have ever experienced because you got to see things that happened in 2020 that you literally would have to go back 150 years to see all these particular events. But we got to see all of these things happen in real time in mm-hmm. 2020. We got to see food shortages. We got to see a plague. We got to see a world shut down, government shut down. We got to see quarantines. We got to see storms. We got to see um, riots. We got to see uh, 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 resources that were not available. We got to see bread lines. We got mm-hmm. to see, you know, um, I was one of the people that was part of the food distribution system, system down here. And if you could just see the fear in people's eyes, you know, going up to their doors. My aunt, God bless her soul, 70 years old. My aunt, when I went and brought food to her, she was looking at me through her screen door crying because she couldn't get me to her because she was just that fearful of what this particular virus, you know, that was proclaimed, that was projected to us, what it would be, you know? So I had to literally leave food on her step. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we, when we when we have these, you know, when, so that year when we saw all these different things burned down, bombs going off in the middle of the night, blowing up ATM machines and things of that nature, wow. you know. And then we seen this, you know, in Philly we saw a real spike in violence, you know, a real spike in violence. We had about five hundred murders last year in Philly, Ooh. you know. And this year it's um we you know what like two days ago they said the murder rate was up. Last year, at this point, it was 70 people getting murdered. Now it's 96 at the same point in time. It's getting, you know, the, these things, these things are happening right in, right before our eyes. We're seeing the transformation of all these different things. You saw the police killings and the lynchings. You know, all these different things happen. It happened in one calendar year. And yeah. I felt like somebody needed to chronicalize that. So I, chron- I that's, this was my way of, of chronicalizing. So the book is actually written in chronological order, probably starting from like February. Mm-hmm. Until, until the last day of 2020. Wow. Yeah, we definitely got to purchase this book. Have it in our um, bookcase. Oh, yeah. right. <laughs> you know definitely got to do that. Wow. But you know what? You make a lot of sense. But however, 2020 did um, open the eyes up to other people. Like, for example, I started up, um, I wrote my first journal you know, a uh, journal book, whereas people is able to read some quotes. Um, I, my sister and I, I, we put our own quotes and I'm a life coach. So I put some of that information in there, ask questions, have, you know, the woman to reflect, um, 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 you know, different things. So I did that, you know, I'm grateful for that. That came through. I mean, every day when I came home from work, I was on a computer. You know, I did a, a 12, 100 PowerPoint slide for domestic violence. I did that in the in the process. So, you know, other people who want to do certain things still didn't allow <clears throat> all the hurt, the pain, the deaths to not get in the way. My husband, he um, graduated with his master's last year as well. So we were still on a roll. We were still working. Mm-hmm. We still did stuff, but that's just us out of so many others that just a lot of people just gave up. We was doing power uh, zooms or we talked about uh, we talked to different people that survived coronavirus and was able to come on and tell us what they did. Um, I had someone to come in about it because a lot of people who were isolated were also going through domestic violence as well. The children was going through child abuse. I had somebody come in and say, hey, we're still taking people, you know, at the shelter, you know. So we were still busy every single day. We stayed busy right from the home. And we did what we have to do to keep our minds right. Because if you allow COVID take you, as in not the, the, the virus itself, but the media, the everyday, the news, the reporter, it would take you and have you extremely paranoid. PTSD, right. that, you know, it will really have you. Uh, my husband got caught up with that COVID. I had yeah. to tell him, cut that TV off and let's <laughs> not know because I got tired of it. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, not to not to not to um to diminish what she's saying in any bit, but 
it really caught it, it really caught me because my father, you know, he was a victim of COVID. You mm. understand what I'm saying? So um he had pre-existing conditions. Now, prior to the COVID coming into the community, they already said, okay, people who have hypertension, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and all of these pre-existing conditions would be the people that would be most at risk for COVID. And, you know, I tried to, I tried to get my father and my mother to understand that, but they was, you know, they was really caught up in the church and they said, listen, that's what they saying, but this is what we're doing. We and pray so over it. We'll pray over it. And he wound up getting caught up in the situation and he caught the situation. So it became a part, it became a major part of my research, is what I'm trying to say. And in that study, I basically um I did a whole paper on the coronavirus. And my main thesis was the coronavirus is not the issue. And one of the things that is is I feel is real important to speak on because you're from Philadelphia is W E B Du Bois and his Philadelphia study, because that came up in my research about how he was looking at the Philadelphia community in the late 1800s and some of the social ills that they was facing at that time, like poverty, lack of education, bad housing, all of these different factors that they call the social determinants of health, they mm -hmm. was affecting them back then. Mm -hmm. So it's like, okay, when we say 2020 vision, you're you're thinking that you're going to see a vision of a prosperous future, but you're not seeing the reality of the detrimental environments that we're living in in the present. Mm -hmm. And that's what I really wanted to bring out, um, saying that the coronavirus is not the issue. It's institutionalized racism mm -hmm. and oppression that we face on a daily, daily basis. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's something poignant that you brought out in your, in your book. Well, I thank you. Um, yeah, I looked at um, a lot of those studies and I was part of a group, too, that really wanted to reach because we were going to chronicalize and actually do a documentary slash book about this whole coronavirus experience. We might still go back to that. Um, but what we did in the, in the early parts of we did, we, we generated a lot of information because I look at everything from from I look at everything as like a war, a war drill. You know, so I look at worst case scenarios and I think back to the fact that this European has never been benevolent when it came to us and that they have been shysty um, from day one. There's 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 words about with rumors and um, and some some very strong rumors um, with, with facts behind them about how the creation of HIV and AIDS and and and, and then there's strong uh, ties to Ebola and all those different things. And it's just amazing. Like, you know, you look at um, there's a study, not a study, but there was a, um, a secret covert mission in South Africa right after when they saw apartheid falling apart. A group of scientists got together and did this thing called Operation Coast, where they had generated these vaccinations that they were going to give to black women to sterilize them. Mm -hmm. So and this was like in the, in the 80s, you know, so mm -hmm. so when we start looking at and there's tons and tons of story, studies and things of that nature, how they just let us die during Hurricane Katrina, all these different things that you see taking place. I am super skeptical and I am not above being a conspiracy theorist when it comes to um, what they possibly can be doing for us. So my first projection, my first action was take all extreme caution. You know when when the coronavirus hit, you mm -hmm. know, then let's learn about it before we can go out here in the streets. And because I'm not one of those people that just I'm not a knee jerk reactionary type of person. Mm -hmm. I want to look at things critically, analyze it, and and come up with the you know I want to look at the pros and cons of all these things. I want to apply critical thinking to the to the process. So you know I was going head to head with a lot of brothers and sisters down here who are saying don't don't fall for it you know this is a whole, this is a uh, a whole mm -hmm. a whole whatever and I'm saying yo um I actually know a few people who died from this so I can't go at it like that right. and I and I and I would have the conversations like I have a health coach me and him went at it on the air cuz I said listen do you feel comfortable enough to tell people to go out there and not wear a mask he said yeah I said cool if they die because That's of that, on your hands. responsibility for sending them that direction. And he said, no. I said, then you shouldn't be telling people that there. Right. You know, ethical. Highly unethical. Right. right. <laughs> Highly unethical. It, it goes against the Hippocratic Oath, 
right? And the fundamental things of a healthcare worker is to do no harm. Mm -hmm. Now, right. you know that this is something that can affect you, especially in a community where you have higher um, 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 opportunities infections and all of these things that make you more susceptible why would you tell people that well and, and his thing was build up your immune system now that part i totally agree with mm -hmm. because the stronger you make your immune system through herbs vitamins and resources i mean um and minerals and and the concoctions homeopathic remedies that have been we're we're, we're, we're people of that you know right um, you know what i'm saying the 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 all the uh what do they call it um I forget what they call it, but basically grandma said, go boil this and go boil that. Yeah. Go <laughs> <laughs> I'm down over there and I got you. You know, so mm -hmm. and, and then so the more I learned about it, the more I learned about, you know, the pros and cons of wearing masks, this, that, and the other, I realized there were places you should wear a mask and places you shouldn't wear a mask. Mm -hmm. You know, I learned the hard way about wearing the mask, working out at the gym. I won't do that no more. I just work out outside. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> but yeah. You know what I'm saying? Uh, but in regards to, you know, our reaction to it, you know, I thought black people should be cautious because everything that's been done, no matter who it hurts, it hurts us more. And Absolutely. even and it's funny that no black people for the first 30 days were identified as having COVID. But then 30 days later, black people were seen as the culprits of spreading COVID, which was very mm. disingenuous when you consider the fact that all of these people that, that possibly contracted and spread it to their families were the ones that you were celebrating as, you know, essential workers. They were the ones that were working in the Walmarts, working in the Dollar Generals, which people were literally going into just to get out of their houses. You know, I went to my, my nephews work at a target and so they were calling me telling me yo uh, man people are just in here walking around holding hands and everything just like that you know because they can't go outside and do it you know what i'm saying so you know the the ways they have of making it where they can always create a, a dynamic where we're the blame or we're the responsibility for something was something i was very keen to you know we're always the scapegoats of america and we become the scapegoats of the world and, that, and that's one thing i would hope that our brothers and sisters in africa and the caribbean and all these other places start to see because we're starting to have some xenophobic issues within our community and i think that if we truly looked at the fact that no matter who we think we are to each other to everybody outside out of this community we are the n-word we mm -hmm. are the the kaffirs you know we are those things that are you know um dredged up and and, and to be dismissed and to to create a bottom class society that's who the world see us as and we mm -hmm. feed into it because we keep trying to change up who we are to blend into what they bought what we believe is acceptable to them and it's wow <laughs> And we never get there because no matter what we do, we will never be acceptable. I explain this thing, this concept to, to our people all the time. Just because you're at a party doesn't mean you got the invitation to invite. You might have crashed the party, but because <laughs> you're entertaining, because you're serving somebody, because you're out there to do the dirty work, they'll let you stay. But the second you overstay, you're welcome. The second you speak out of turn, they will remind you that you were not invited here and they will force you out. They will they will exit you, you know, get you out of there forcefully. You mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? So um, that's how we have to look at it. And then we have to look at, forget their party. Let's build our own, let's have our own party. Let's build- That's where I'm at. To the table. Let's have our own table. We can do that's those That's right. Things. That's right. I, I believe that a too. quick visitor. He wanted to shout everybody out. Say peace. <laughs> I see, I see. Come on, you got to come on camera. Come now on, he don't want to get on. Now you scared? Say peace. <laughs> Say peace, <laughs> baby. <laughs> oh my goodness. So um that's funny you mentioned that because um when I was at work, you know, I, I was it when I was at work, I was talking to a couple of sisters and I did not know they had their own um nonprofit, for profit businesses on the side. So one of the ladies said that she wanted to start up her own um uh they um what is it? Boutique online. Mm -hmm. And she said that she was scared. But meanwhile, she's sitting there eating um, Mexican food. Mm -hmm. I don't have none. Of, I don't have none against whatever food you want to eat. But if you're not scared to eat Mexican, Chinese, Thai, uh, <laughs> Caribbean, uh, you know, all these different foods from different restaurants, if you're not scared to do that, if you're not scared to get on a plane to go on your vacation 
or whatever it is that you like to do, if you're not scared to do that, why are you scared to start up something for yourself? And when I was, I just said that. I just, I didn't even say the last piece, what I just mentioned to y'all. She just stood, stood there and she just said, yeah, actually, she's right. <laughs> mm-hmm. Like, what are, why are you scared? This is something that you want to do. Put your, um, your, 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 put your steps in. Do what you got to do. Do your research. Start mm-hmm. it up. And then she's like, now as we continue to talk, one of the other sisters, she got a for profit business, and she's telling us what she used to do, and she get the, the hookup from other uh, online and this. And the lady started listening. She's like, oh, my goodness. I did not know that you did and knew all of this. So now, mm-hmm. now you, you, you open up. You talk with other people. You don't know what other people have done. Now she can help you. And let's make it work. I have my own nonprofit. It's, it's not easy. It's an everyday thing. But I get out here and I speak about domestic violence. I educate our people on it. Why? Because... It's more to just physical. It's emotional. It's all of these different factors on domestic violence. And that's something I do. You know, I don't go out here. People think because you hear domestic violence, you think I'm busting down your door and saving you. That's not what I'm doing right now. You know, I am working on getting a shelter, which is great. But for right now, let's start educating. You know, um, like what you're doing. You educating the masses on Black history. You know, my husband educating the masses on health, you know, and so much black history as well. This man is always working. So with that being said, we need a strong team to come together and say, hey, you go over to the school on a Monday and you speak about black history. Hey, you go to that same school Tuesday. You talk about domestic violence. Wednesday, you go in there, you talk about COVID. So now people get a full dose of what this team does. And that's what we need to, we need to start growing teams and start really working together. So I'm going to ask the next question, which is, you said one reason I do not talk about the divide between um, black and woman, black men and black women is because neither said, um, neither side is serious about solving the problems. You know, this is what I'm just saying. So can you expand on that? What do you mean by you don't really um, speak on that? And and I and I and I'll really pre- preface that by saying that was a segue into several other um, um, entries that I had um, put. Like that was a conversation starter because I wanted to draw people in. Mm. I, do, I do think black people really want to fix this. We wouldn't mm-hmm. be so upset, angry at one another if we didn't. You know, I think black men. I know for a fact black men love black women, and I know for a fact black women love black men. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's just a matter of us putting aside all the years that have been, you know, the, the systemic wedges that have mm-hmm. been put in place, the systemic uh, emasculation, you know, that took place and all of these different values that are not natural to us. You know, all these different things that don't have. So we, we need to first and foremost, as I went back and said earlier, we all need therapy. Mm-hmm. One of us needs therapy. I myself take therapy when I get a chance and mm-hmm. I'm a therapist. Too. And so I, you know, I need therapy. I need to talk and help stress out. I need to know whether or not I'm moving the right way. I need to know am I in my feelings about something. I need right. to know as to whether or not I'm dealing with post-traumatic stress syndrome from something else, whether I have depression that's reoccurring. And is this a symptom of that? I need to know those things. And then I also mm-hmm. need to know, you know, what can I do to be better for myself first? Self-love. Mm-hmm. Self-care, self-love. Mm-hmm. All those different things so that I can be the best possible candidate for the, the sister that, that eventually, you know, I'm, I am I envision marrying, building mm-hmm. a family. Even at my age, I'm looking still to build a family. Mm-hmm. So um, I, I, that was a segue into a much bigger conversation to get um, to, to, to get brothers and sisters that are even talking. Because right now what you're having you know, you're seeing a lot of brothers and sisters who are pretty much going their own way. Mm-hmm. And we we really bought into this rugged individualism and we really bought into, and here's where the one argument I will go against capitalism and materialism. As we start using those as markers in terms of who we can be and who we are, this, that, and the other. Well, 
you know, I know rich people that went bankrupt. I know people who were poor that got became rich. You just never know economically where a person is, but a person's character is always going to shine through. And so, in a person, especially if they, you know, I consider myself to be African centered. And when I say mm -hmm. African centered, that strictly means black first, mm -hmm. no matter, but you know, all diaspora, but I'm black first on everything we speak on. That's so, right. When we start, you know, having um, those conversations, I wanted to start a conversation because I saw a brother has shared that conversation, and then he didn't he didn't follow up on the mm. conversation after that, so he had to take it down because he had made <laughs> a remark about it, mm -hmm. and um, and then he had to take it down because it led to other conversations where brothers were talking about what they what they bring to the table for a woman. What 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 does a black? I asked sisters, what does a black man look like to you? You know, mm. as the brothers, what the sisters look like to you, and mm -hmm. why can't you know? Let's let's start talking about not not creating these therapy groups online, but let's talk about you know just basically values and stuff, and and what values do we what, which values attract, and and we and what are you looking for? And the sisters all said the same thing. I mean, they want security. They want, and when you talk security. You know, they want to know that if the, if, if the house is secure, they want their financial security and they want their physical security. They 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 want to know that they're protected. Mm -hmm. And brothers were saying, we want the spirit of cooperation. We want to know that we can work and build and create empires, blah, blah, blah. You know, that, but the conversation started. You know, right. I wasn't skilled enough to continue to go in that route because I'm not a relationships counselor. Mm -hmm. so I wasn't skilled enough to take, so when the conversation go, went left, Trying to get it back on put that wasn't I said so okay, let's scrap it, but at least now we're having another conversation. Right. So that was the purpose of that post. Um, and that and that page in the book, because this oh, was okay. that, <laughs> full transparency. I had just gotten out of a situation for which those questions weren't being answered. Got it, got so, it. You know, we we was on a um on a podcast the other day, and I spoke about domestic violence. We was in Brooklyn. And um, shout out to them for allowing me to come out there and speak and stimulating the mind, which was awesome. Um, and my husband is my number one supporter. And it's, it's so funny because the young lady turned around and he was sitting on the sideline and asked him a question, which was great because nobody never done that before. Like, mm -hmm. you know, when you hear about her story, how did it affect you? as her man, because some men will say, um, you know, sexual abuse, a woman who gone through sexual abuse or domestic violence is like, how does it affect you? Do you want to go out there and do something to, to the brother? Or do you look at it like this girl's really messed up? How do you, how do you tackle that? So he basically said that he had to, first of all, he's, he's a mature man and he had to do research on it as well. And once he did the research, he understood why I was coming from with um, domestic violence, you know, and it made me feel um, a little bit more at ease because he did do the research about it. He was able to understand how I felt. So, you know, as the, the night continued, the young lady kept asking us both questions hmm. about relationships. And it was like, only way you had only way you're asking these questions about relationships is because maybe you are looking for that type of relationship. So starting up a conversation now and making the people feel at ease to just flow is everything. But I do want to ask you this very last one. And it's all my community violence against our people. Like there's, there's been a whole bunch of community violence towards our black woman. The hate is real. With a lot of the brothers, um, a lot of the brothers, I didn't say all the brothers, but a lot of them, like my husband came home, he said that um, a guy in a gym, uh, this lady had asked him, can you move over, you know, I guess the space issue. And he was like, nah, I ain't moving B and called all type of names. And it wasn't, my husband was sitting there. He's like, this don't feel right. I have to let this brother know he's wrong. He never once wanted to apologize to the young lady, but when his um, one of his friends that he was working out with, he's a Muslim brother, he got the brother to say sorry to the woman, I guess the way they spoke to one another. But regardless, when another man is approaching you humbly and say, listen, brother, 
you just called her B and she's an older woman. She is a woman. She didn't say anything wrong. You know, at the end of the day, why would you have to go off like that? Like, we we are so disconnected. What's going on? What's your thoughts on that? No, well, it, it kind of goes back to when we were talking earlier. And I'm going to keep saying it. As a community, we need therapy. <laughs> <laughs> we need therapy. Because um, whatever whatever triggered that brother to, to say that, mm -hmm. you know, because you know, I don't, I wasn't there. I don't know the whole situation, but um, I like me myself. I believe in holding everybody accountable. I believe sure. in holding men and women in our community accountable because I think that's the only way we're going to fix things. However, mm -hmm. you will never see me in public disrespecting a black woman. You will never see that because I feel like as black women, it take me back to when um, a cousin of mine um, died in a car accident. I was about fifteen. And, you know, 15, 16, and we were all trying to, you know, a group of about five of us were, you know, brothers were looking for clothes for the funeral. And we walked up upon a sister, an elder, um, who was trying to get into her car. And when she saw us walking up, she was shaking so bad, she dropped her keys. And I just, at that point, I just melted. Like, I couldn't, because I'm looking at that like she should feel safe seeing us come up. And the wow. fact that he saw us like that, really, like, like to this day, I still remember that. We're talking 30 years ago. And I wow. still remember where we were, who was with me, and what happened. I can almost remember her face, but I couldn't really see it because she was turning away from us. Right. You know, and, you know, um, and I just stopped. I said, damn. You know, I don't even, you know, and I looked at each, and we looked at each other because we all saw it. And, you know. And I'm talking about, you know, guys I came up with, they were, you know, they were the real dudes. Mm -hmm. uh, but we all looked at each other like, man, that's, you know, we all felt terrible about it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, um, and I have been one of those brothers, you know, there was a domestic violence situation a couple of years ago across the street from me. And I heard, you know, one of my neighbors yelling at the man across the street, well, male across the street, because I don't, you know, you mm -hmm. kind of lose that manhood thing with mm -hmm. me. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, so I went over and I addressed him. I said, and I asked the sister, I said, sis, did he put his hands on you? Mm -hmm. Now, of course, you know, she didn't acknowledge it. And I told right. him, I said, hey, man, if I, if it's in a situation like this, it's going to get physical between me and you. Cause I can't, we can't have that. That's not what mm -hmm. man is around here. And, mm -hmm. you know, so we, we, we really have to examine that particular dynamic and because i've seen videos of god of, of males smacking sisters in the face with with skateboards and stuff and i'm mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. you, know, you know but that's that's about that's really what it is that's about first of all commit um um, um i'm going to commend your husband for, for stepping into that situation because it's not easy because that mm -hmm. could escalate into a situation you know right. but um i want to commend him for that but it take but he was the catalyst for the other brother stepping up and saying something. Because right. I promise you, the, the brother that said it was comfortable enough in front of the other brother to, to do that. Mm -hmm. But it caused something in the other brother to say, yo, you know what? Let me just check you real quick. Right. You know, Absolutely. So, those, so, so you have a domino effect, but it always takes the first one. And mm -hmm. that's the issue with us in the community. We don't want to be the first one. You know, mm. somebody else does it, then we all jump out there like, yeah, and cheer them on. We don't want, we have on the porch syndrome that I call it. You know, some people call it, <laughs> right. but we have on the porch syndrome. Like, we'll stand on our porch and watch some crazy happen, and mm -hmm. then we'll turn around and wait for somebody else to do something about it. Mm -hmm. One out there to do something about it. It's you know? true. So, that, you might be right on that. I mean, um, I was one also from growing up, one to butt in you know, when it come down to something wrong, I, even with work, you know, I, I'm that, I'm that person, you know, mm -hmm. cause at the end of the day, we are allowing certain things to happen because we just don't know. And since I do know it's for me as a woman to step up and say something about it. So yes, I, I did tell him the other day, I do need you to come home. So now every battle is yours, please. I need my <laughs> husband to come home. So at the end of the day, you know, um, 
we do need help. We do need therapy. I do have a podcast every Tuesday and this whole month, Women's Month, I'm talking about mental health with different people. So I need, I need it too. You, we all need somebody to talk to. Like you said, even someone who's doing the work that you're doing, um, when my husband losing his, his father and his sister as well, um, he needed to talk to somebody too. So at the end of the day, we are going to get better with this. I believe so. I and believe. Goes, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to cut you off. No, it's so, okay. That goes back to what we were talking about earlier with the question about brothers and sisters trying to get together, right? Mm -hmm. Because you know, if you, the, the more couples you have to work together, the more people feel like they're not by themselves. Right. And 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 especially with with COVID nineteen the tw year twenty twenty. Mm -hmm. Nobody, you know, we didn't feel that's the most isolated any of us have ever felt. Mm -hmm. No, I mean, even if you just take the fact that everybody's wearing a mask, so you can't even see facial expression. You you just remove the human element. Right. The thing that us from dealing with each other psychologically speaking, we're just walking drones, you know, right. and Ooh. out here. So, you know, and a lot of people are suffering from that, unfortunately. And, and, and so, I mean, I've had several situations where I've had to sort of like calm a situation down because I was going to get involved into an altercation. You know, mm -hmm. and there's several times when people came to me certain ways. I'm like, you know what? I kind of know what's going on. Mm -hmm. And I don't, my manhood isn't based on, you know, um, th those things that, 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 that aggression piece. Right. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> I'm, <You're> right. <laughs> I'm not a pushover. But at the mm -hmm. same time, I, I like to apply critical thinking to everything I do. That's because good. I have people that's dependent on me and I need to get home. Just like you said, we need to get home. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, just like when cops say they go to work, their job is to make it home off their shift. When we out here in these streets, our job is to make it home. And we be in some of the most dangerous neighborhoods in the world, mm -hmm. you know. And so our job is to make it home. And we have to have these, you know. So and, and a lot of it, too, now we, we really have to reestablish what, what manhood is in our community. Mm -hmm. You know, and we have to reestablish it so... Um, the rights of passage programs, the the Jegnas, you know, meeting these young brothers with the young. Because I have great relationships with a lot of the young brothers in my neighborhood, the That's twenty somethings, the teenagers. Um, I have a lot of good relationships with them, and it's just based on the fact that I treat them with respect. I don't mm -hmm. come from the man from the standpoint of I'm your elder, listen to me, or else. I come to them from the perspective of, hey, young brother, you okay? Everything. Absolutely. Good. Are we cool? You know, you're having some problems. Let me know. Um, there's times when I've seen these children, specifically young brothers at the supermarkets, trying to help people with their groceries and they getting treated like outcasts and trash. And, you know, and I'm seeing them dejected and I have to walk over to them and build them up. Hey, come here, young brother. Help me with mm -hmm. my bed. How many of y'all? Five of y'all. OK, OK. Y'all going to split $50. What? 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 Yeah, I need to. We need to do something to build them back up I because know. what That's you good. do. If you give them the cold shoulder today, they're going to give you the cold heart tomorrow. Mm. So 10, 11, 12 years old, if you don't get to these young brothers out here now and some of these young sisters, by the time they turn 15 and 16, they're going to be the ones menacing your community. And they're going to remember the day they came to you asking for $2 to help you put your groceries in the car and you turned them down. Now they're going to go into your house and take whatever they want. That's a true fact. Wow. So, so we the call in. We at the call in section of the interview. Mm -hmm. Um, if anybody wow. wants to call in and ask the uh brother Professor Carl Tone Jones a question about some of the stuff that we have spoken here today about, uh, the call in number is 347-450-6397. That's 347-450-6397. This has been an excellent interview. Yes, um, for sure. Know, this is this is you know the time is going by, <laughs> um, but I really wanted to read a few passages from the book because I really you know um, want to illustrate some things you know, especially when it came to like the the vote. I saw the tide change. I saw a lot of nationalists, black nationalists in particular, talking about vote as if your life depended on it, and it mm -hmm. got behind Kamala Harris, mm -hmm. not digging into the fact that she's not the president. You know, I mean, the vice president's position is important in, in American politics, but the president, you know, 
that's where <laughs> that's where <laughs> you know the buck stops there at executive decisions ability to veto laws pass laws by you know um executive orders and so forth so one of the things i wrote about was um well i'm gonna start with the last one first and then i'm coming to the political one but um one part i just said is i'm tired of it being okay to kill black people be it mm. the, street, the ones wearing the sheets you know i am tired of this i am mm -hmm. so tired of young people specifically i mean i don't care what age you get but the younger you get the more life you just took you, you don't know who that person was about to become you, right. you know if, if they were never to become any more than a janitor working in a school locker room i don't care that person deserves the chance to die from natural causes to live a long life to experience it and we have got to start putting more of a precipice on preserving black lives and not just from the point where we can just use it as a, a statistic or as a rally you know rally to uh to to benefit certain organizations which shall not be named um so, so you know when i speak to that I, I i really get passionate about that because um i don't like going to funerals and as a teacher that worked in both the high school and as a um professor i had to go to funerals of my children and wow. let me tell you, the most gut-wrenching stuff you ever have to deal with when mm. you raise somebody you got them out of their situation you know and they left that school with the mindset well i'm gonna be great in life and you find out they got gunned down on the street mm. so, um it's it's crazy um so then the next one i, I read and this is page 30 31 and 32 um, when it comes to Amer the American political arena, black voters don't matter because there is no black power to make anybody accountable to black people. Uh -huh. And, you know, um, I, I speak about that because I speak and we look at right now when I've asked people that were all about promoting the politic, the political landscape. And I asked them, I said, well, so for all of this cheerleading that you did, what did you get out of it? And none of them can bring back anything. You know, I had one friend who gave me a valid reason for why she voted because they were about to privatize the in, the government and job that she had, which meant that, you know, she would lose perks benefits and then they would be able to sort of, they would, they would create situations where they would move, be able to move them out of their position that they've worked, you know, for the last five, six, seven years. in. so I got that part, you know, um, but for the most part, when you look at what's happening in the community, you look at the benefits, you look at all the things that come down the pike. I'm like, I'm still waiting for um, I'm still waiting for that reward for being the ones. And, and this is where I, I critique my sisters a little bit because I say, you know, black women, I, I love you so much. I, will, I don't want to see you get used and abused. And a lot of times that comes off as sounding like criticism. But what I'm saying is don't let people use you for their own benefit when you're not going to get anything in the long run. You're not going to get any return. So when they made black women the face of this political um, and, and, and they sort of said um, black women save the Democratic Party, I'm like, cool. So what new perks are black women getting out of this? Because y'all not going to use our sisters like y'all did in the 60s and the 70s. And, you know, <laughs> and and so, um, you know, you get a little pushback on that, but I'm fine with it because I know my intention is to make sure that as black people, period, you know, we don't get used and abused. Um, they put black faces on uh, these political campaigns and then they call them multicultural and nobody blacks getting nobody black gets any benefits from it. So, you know, we, you know, we're going to push and keep pushing and, and, and force people to think critically. Um, one of the reasons why I wrote my book the way I did with no essays involved except for the office forward was because I wanted people to read the passages in the book. And, and I wanted them to draw their own conclusion. I was having a conversation with some family, ironically, from Brooklyn, uh, who was in town last night and who had read the book. And they were saying, wow, you know, the way you wrote that book, I was able to sit back. And sometimes I got stuck on a few pages and I just kept reading over and over. Wow. And right. And, so we got a caller. We got a caller. Not okay. that we got a caller. We got a caller. Um, state your name and where you from. Caller. Caller, can you hear him? No, 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 we can't hear him. Hello, don't listen to the don't listen to the um stream. Hello, hello, brother Mark. <laughs> yeah. Mark. <laughs> can you hear me? Yes, yes, uh, we hear you loud and clear. The man yeah. in the this, building. This is brother Mark, <laughs> Can you hear me? Yes, we hear you, Uncle Mark. Okay. 
I just want to remind your listeners that Brother Carl Tom Jones, along with June Benson and Brother RJ Taimba a few years ago, had Black Inauguration Day. And what that was about was the fact to teach and tell our Black people that our salvation does not come from who is in the White House. Mm -hmm. And so when he talked about Black people being elated with the with uh, Kamala Harris, yes, yeah, she is in second position, not the first position. And mm -hmm. even if she was, we also have to take her record into question. Mm -hmm. But what I would like for Professor Carlton to speak about, and I'll give a little backdrop, I was a student teacher in the Black Studies Department at Lehman College and also at City College with Dr. Leonard Jeffries and also Dr. Jane Smalls, who's from my mother hometown, Georgetown, South Carolina. I began hosting panel discussions behind the movie documentary, Hitting Cullen to Wake Up Our People. And later I connected with Q Butter and I co-hosted panel Let's Build, the New Conscious Movement. And there I met Brother Taimba and Professor Carlton Jones. So I would like for Professor to talk about his connection with Brother R.J. Taimba, who is the founder of Harlem Liberation School. And we also had Brother Carl Tong to premiere his movie at the Harlem State Office Building. And Sister Shanice, you were there when another sister of mine, who is the founder of Afro-American Women in Cinema, had Brother Carl Tong at the Harlem State Office Building, and members of Harlem Liberation School was there, along with our brother, Achille Rose, to support Brother Carl. So, Brother Carl, I have pictures from that day in my archives. But please talk about your connection with Harlem Liberation School. Thank you. Uh, I say, I say. Oh. <laughs> When the mayor asks, you shall receive. Yes, uh, indeed. <laughs> I personally um, identify our good brother as the mayor of Harlem. Um, but um, one of the things that, um, one of the truly the, the, the great things that came out of the Let's Build, um, the Let's Build movement um, that, that our brother Q Butter had orchestrated was the fact that I had got to connect with so many, um, so much of the family in New York. Um, we, I think the first time we did it, we were in, we were in Brooklyn. I'm not sure exactly where, but no, um, I know, I'm not sure exactly the section in Brooklyn, but you know, uh, my good brother, um, Stephen Ilflo Adams mm -hmm. had hosted and it was at his, his location, um, Minnie's World. And that's where the that was the first um, time I got to actually meet Q um, in person. And then he had another program for which I was um, simulcasting. So I had to uh, pretty much what we're doing now, uh, <laughs> uh, do a video cast in, um, in New York. And, and they were at the same facility. But the last one I recall um, that I was at was where I met Brother Aj Tayemba. We were already Facebook friends. Um, but the la it was in, um, Brooklyn loft, the Brooklyn loft. And, um, I believe I'm not, I'm not mistaken. I'm trying to remember the street, but I know it was in best -Stuy. It was in Bevis Stuyvesant. So, um, uh, my relationship with brother IJ has been really, you know, um, I consider that I consider him to be a true brother. Mm -hmm. Uh, been, um, we've been 
several different places around the country. We've been in uh, Mississippi and Memphis uh, working with other um, projects and, and, and other um, platforms. We have, um, he was one of the people who I would contact on a daily basis in regards to the progress of the Independence Day project. So he was very integral in helping to not only develop the concept, but when we would, we would literally add pieces to the film based on the conversation we had. So there's a there's a part in there where he um I think he had gotten to a debate with one of the brothers from the Nation of Islam, and uh, he wanted to really talk about and we started talking about the need for um, Africana studies. So I said, well, listen, why don't we just add that to the film? We really need to tech, you know, we needed some things for education anyway. Mm -hmm. So let's add that piece. And so he did that and he sent it to me and um and, and it's in the film uncut. You know, um, so um, we've been working for years. Um, that that um, brother of mine, and actually, here's a funny thing, man. We uh, we we did road we road trip to Mississippi. So wow. This queen came to Philly, and I drove to um to Missis to Mississippi from Philly, and then from Mississippi back to Philly. Mm -hmm. So um, it was it was a um, it was a powerful experience, you know um. And when you get to and when you go places and you and you get to actually live with people for a few days, you get to see the real versions of them. And you know that's that's my brother. You know, IJ, the work he's been doing with um, Harlem Liberation School, and then mm -hmm. earning that to um, Black Liberation University, for which unfortunately YouTube um, took his channel down because of some hacking. Um, mm. Wow. So, so he's trying to rebuild his platform. You know, and he had. I think he was on today, actually. On YouTube. Either on YouTube or Facebook, I saw something today. Yeah, I'm on Facebook. Uh, mm -hmm. But oh, um, wow, yeah. So we, you know, and so we've been, but even still, the work is still there. You know, his work, right. his, you know, um, his experiences. Uh, I think that anybody should, if they wanted to, you know, get some books that you want to relate to the youth. He has a book, you know, um, I believe it's called Truth to Our Youth. And mm -hmm. um, he also has a book on community organizing, which I think is a great book for anybody oh, okay. and um, learning the intricacies of, of community organizing and, and being able to have the, it. It's very well written and very easy to transfer from book to, to practical application. Nice. Brother Ajay is um, definitely, uh, I used to go to Harlem Liberation School right there um, in Manhattan in Harlem. And it really did inspire me as well. I had the opportunity to meet so many different people and to hear um, our life struggles, our you know our history, and I loved every bit of it. Um, my husband and I, he started coming as well, so we we definitely know about Brother Aj and his queen as well. She was a part of We Are Phenomenal Woman. We marched together and a few other things. So I definitely appreciate them as well. Um, we, Brother Haji, if you hear us, hopefully you could get on to Speak Your Mind podcast with the Ailees. We are we definitely appreciate you to come in and um, and enlighten us as well on on your part. So yes, definitely um, amazing. Like I said once again, so many of us is doing great work out here in the community, and um, we just got to tap in, plug in to those people and connect. Um, I know uh, on Martin Luther King and Salma, they held, they lock arms together. That needs to be us. Mm -hmm. That needs, that needs to be um, our resource manual. Lock arms with those who's doing great work. Mayor Mark, you know, right. <laughs> he, he connect, he knows everybody. He connect us with everybody, you know. So, everybody. Yes. I walked into Harlem Loft. He was like, and brother C.T. Jones is in the building. <laughs> That's right. That's right. That was my first time. That was our second yeah. time. <laughs> He's an amazing, amazing man. And brother Akil, when he was here, he was also amazing, you know, king as well. So I definitely appreciate the people that's in our circle. Definitely. Uncle Mark, you have anything else to ask? Uncle Mark. He must have, he must have placed his phone down. All He's right, listening. if you're listening, okay. 
So listen, we 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 done reached the two hour mark on this podcast. Wow. <laughs> so we definitely had an awesome conversation. And I know you probably have a couple more things to say, like as far as your plugins, where can people reach you? Where can they get the book and where can they get the Independence Day project if they want to delve into that information? So please um, you know, line everybody up where they can get you. And well, what's your next project? I'm sorry. Right, 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 right. <laughs> Well, oh, I'm glad you mentioned that too, because um, I'll start with the last question first. The next project is we're actually looking into. I say we, that's me. Um, <laughs> looking into uh, getting getting a film company started. Oh, um, nice! And and then in the process of getting a film company started, you know, um, because when I did the first film, I learned all that stuff on the fly. I had no idea about what I was doing. I had to learn about lighting, camera, all this. I want to actually do it the right way the next time <laughs> so it wouldn't be so hard because it took me two and a half years to finish that project. Um, so the next project is going to be sort of, I want it to be the evolution um, of the Independence Day project. So when I always talk about the first one, I always talk about the vision. Mm -hmm. you know, I talk about That's the vision. Now mm -hmm. I want to talk about practical application. I want to address the spirituality aspect that we really didn't touch on as much. Um, and I want to talk to people that have been in movements, They're not necessarily black nationalist movements, but these are people who are involved in movements um, such as, um, you know, uh, uh, Mama Pam Africa with, the, um, with, with MOVE down here in Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm very, you know, very, very much in touch with the MOVE family right now. They're fighting to get Mami Abu Jamal free from prison. He's um, contracted COVID. Yeah. Wow. Wow. And they're allowing they, they, what they're trying to do is they're trying to allow him to to continuously get these afflictions until it kills him. So you know they've been putting pressure on that. So you know the families down here going to the courthouses, they're going to the district attorney's offices to um, to mandate that they release him. He, I mean he fits all the criteria to be released from prison after this mm -hmm. time. They death sentence off the table. So now he's just in there serving life. So they need to take him out of there just like they got everybody else out of there. Mm -hmm. so, where community comes in because see there's no real consequence to dealing with us because we don't function as community and that's the biggest issue for us so um but that's another conversation uh <laughs> Mark, back in. it's something you had to say uncle mark uncle mark you there yeah i hear is something else you had to say yeah okay go just tell me when go ahead okay so brother, so brother Carlton Jones, <laughs> I have a message for you. I sure. On behalf of the president and founder of Families United for Solution, uh, that would be our brother Robert Hart. He asked me to extend an invite for you to come on our sometime next month if your time will permit you we are on the air on mondays from seven o'clock to eight thirty and if mondays don't fit your schedule we also do program for the youth which is on tuesdays from seven to eight thirty so we are Full with speakers for Women's Month, which Sister Shanice is one of our special speakers. So as soon as April comes, I'm asking you in advance because I know that you will be in great demand. And we would like to speak to you, of course, about the Independence Day Project and also your book, and all the new stuff that you say that you plan to work on. So, brother, with that, I say thank you. With the love of Harlem Liberation School in my heart, I say thank you to the Ali's, and I say thank you, my brother, for being part of the broadcast. Thank Have you. Peace, Uncle Mark. Thank you. Thank you. Peace. Thank you so much, brother Mark, and uh, and I appreciate because actually you're the one that sort of pout, put this all together. So um, we, we can talk. Um, I do. I am going to be a part of a new podcast 
series that starts on ironically the first Monday of the month. So, wow. but Tuesday I'm available. Tuesday I don't have anything on the um on the schedule. Um, mm -hmm. so I'm available Tuesday. So, um, brother Mark, we'll be in contact with one another to, um, to coordinate that. Um, so yes, I am part of a, a new podcast series. Then, um, let us know so we could tune in. Right. Oh, definitely. Yeah. Um, as soon as I get more information, cause we're just finalizing everything now. We don't even have a name for it yet, but, okay. um, you know, somebody who I grew up with, um, a sister on the block and, um, and, 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 uh, um, you know, um, we're working out of a studio in um, the Kensington, sort of the Kensington Frankfurt area, of Philly. So um, we'll be that will be, and it's basically like a conversation, like similar to what we're doing right now. But we're going to pick up hot topic issues in this area and and whatever applies to the um, international audience because they have an international platform. So the more information I get about that, the more information I'll be you know bringing forward. Um, the uh, ways people can reach me uh, is if you want copies of my film, The Independence Day Project, you can just go to blackindependence.org. I'm currently right now, my, my um, book, I'd advise people to get it from, um, I'd advise people to get the book from Amazon. And all you have to do is call, type in my name, Carl Tone Jones, and the book title will pop up. Or you could just type in the title, 2020 Through the Eyes of a Social Media Revolutionary. And the title will pop up. I am building up my store, but it's not there yet. So, and I know when um, people are asking for it, they want it. Mm -hmm. You know, right? right. I, I'm, yeah. I'm literally telling people to put money back in their pockets because I don't want to hold on the money and not have the product for them. You know, so. Um, but I we will be. Black Amazon. School. We need a black Amazon, man. Yeah, well, you know, it's funny. We had a brother in New York that was trying to make, um, trying to create it, um, but I just don't think he had, you know how it is with us. <laughs> we got to see we it. We give up too quick. Yeah, we got to we gotta see it trending before we jump on board. And, um, mm. you know, so um, we, we have to start seeing the potential in our own build, and we have to start seeing the power in ourselves and each other. That's right. Mm -hmm. And we have to be willing to accept power because I think power is the issue. We're afraid of power. Yeah. We look power being radioactive and not like yo, we can harness it. And and because radio radiation in itself is dangerous, but radiation itself is also the resources that gives us life. I mean, we go out to the sun every day. That's the purest form of radiation. And Absolutely. we take it every day. So, you know, we're just afraid, you know, it's like um uh, what they say, you got so high in the sky, you re you touch the sun and got burnt. Mm -hmm. We're afraid of getting burnt, not realizing mm -hmm. that you know we we can control all of this. We can control Absolutely. all the power and we can be the, 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 the purveyors of our own destiny, our own futures. I just look at it like this. I could not look into the child, a child. I don't even have children, but I can't even look into the eye of a child and say, you know what? This is what I'm prepared. I'm comfortable leaving you with. Mm. You know, I'm mm. just not comfortable leaving our children with what's going on. And especially what I see in the immediate forecast and the forecast for the future it's hmm. not looking good for black people. Everybody else is circling their wagons, and we're out here talking about crab legs and vacations. Mm. We got minds wrapped around real serious issues, and we can't stop being the world's children because yes. people, because we're, we're the world's children, but we're the foster children of the world. So they don't, you know, so. you know, we were talking about abuse earlier. Nobody gets abused more than a foster child because nobody thinks a foster child has anybody to to, to look out for them. Mm. That's what we have to do. So we have to, you know, we have to get up on our own and build our own and protect our own. Mm. You're absolutely right. So you said that basically they can go on Amazon and um, purchase your book. Mm -hmm. That's number one. And then they could also go on your Facebook page underneath Carlton Jones. Yes, it can. Okay. Okay. And, and, and you can get the film. Like if you want to go to Facebook, that's, positive, that's fine. Messenger. I answered the messenger. I have not been active on social media purposefully. Um, I'm at the point right now where I feel like we've reached all the people we can reach. It's time to build with those who are ready to build. And mm -hmm. when we start building, the ones that we didn't reach will see the build and they'll gravitate to it. It's similar to, you know, the difference between what Wakanda and Zion in the Matrix. And in the Matrix, you know, and, and um, Wakanda, Wakanda was beautiful, but it was hidden. They, they, they hoarded their resources. And then when they gave their resources to the world, they gave it to white folk. Um, mm. <laughs> when, you know, Zion... Zion didn't recruit a single person. 
when people decided they wanted to be free, they went looking for Zion and they were snatched out of the matrix. Right. That's what I'm looking for right now. The That's ones right. who want to be free so that we can snatch and create our own Zion anywhere we go, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. our own maroon society anywhere we go. But, you know, because that from that we can create the radius to which we can build power for our people. You know, the only reason, and, and, and I just want one quick thing because then I have to, my brother IJ and his um, beautiful queen um, Brenda, they are having an auction right now for some mm -hmm. painting from Brenda's daughter, and I want to get one. Oh, <laughs> yes, indeed. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, the, um, the thing that, the, one of the things I want to say is in regards to, you know, us in power and building power, and building black power, too many people have the wrong idea about what that is, and it sort of scares them off. When I say black nationalism for black people, you know, I am going back to what Malcolm X was saying, but I'm saying it from the regards of I'm not talking about us walking down the street dressed like, you know, um, Khalid Muhammad. Much love and respect to Khalid Muhammad because he was the warrior's warrior, warrior, king, warrior. But I'm not talking about that. What I'm talking about is. I want us to be a protected class of people so that nobody feels comfortable messing with us, that mm -hmm. nobody feels comfortable picking and plucking us off to the point where people in our own community see that, see the reverence and respect that it takes to maintain that, and they don't even want to be part of that. That's what I look at. So when I'm thinking about black liberation, I'm not thinking about walking down or walking around with guns and all this other stuff. I don't, I'm not against it. I have a few guns of my own, but um I'm not against it, but what I'm really thinking about is that black girl walking to the store and nobody bothering her. And if anybody plays a finger on her head, touches a hair on her head, they have hell to pay for it. And the same thing with little black boys. And I want a future that's safe for them to go wherever they want, to live liberated and free, to be unoppressed in their mind so they can let the creative beauty and their creativity just flow with no apprehensions whatsoever. I watch white kids, I work with white kids who who are the, some of the most horrible human beings in the world. And and when Ooh. I saw them, the, and I'm not, you know, I'm just being real. The, mm -hmm. the, when I saw them, they didn't come home to a world full of consequences. They came home to a world of redirect, restructure, take their energy and put it somewhere else. Be creative, use your imagination, be free. All types of Legos and all types of all these little gym, jungle gyms and all these other things they built in their house. And they were able, and from that, you can expand your creative lens. Our children don't have that freedom right now because they're too busy worrying about somebody putting a phone bill in their name. You know, we have, and they're too busy worrying about going to school and being treated and suspended for acting uh, in their own nature. And, mm -hmm. and all, I don't want that for our children. Or being on some them. type of drugs to right. make them, um, be, you know, be zombie like. But you know what? I I know we're about to get off, but I I mentioned this before. Back in the day, the the guys, the drug dealers, back in the day, they used to police the area. They used to police the block, you know, and they made sure that nobody came on that block and disrespected the, the females or the young girls, like you said. And I think that's what we need again, not drug dealers, but the policing our community as well. You know, um, I think more and more of us should stop being afraid and stand up. I remember with some girls that was jumping a uh, one girl and I hear them in the back and I'm like, what the heck is going on? So I went out there and I actually, you know, helped the young girl who was being, got jumped. I even walked her all the way home because I wanted to make sure they wouldn't follow her. So, you know, we need more people like that to, to, to police our area. You know, if I see a young man walking down the street, I will kind of tease him and say, hey, you got to stay in the back of your pants. Do you know that? And he'd be like, for real, ma'am? And pull up his pants, you know? So that was my way of, of making somebody pull up his clothes. I don't want to see your butt when you're walking. <laughs> but, you know. Oh, we got a caller? Yeah. Peace, caller. State your name and, and, and where you from, caller. Hello? They listening to them. You got to yeah. turn the stream down in the back. Why are you yelling? <laughs> Because I don't know if they can hear me. They listening to the stream in the back. <laughs> he listening to everything you saying in the background. Wait, wait, wait to get on there. Yeah. Well, anyway, if he catches up, he'll call back in. Okay. Well, one, one, you know, one of the things that you know, speaking of what you're saying, says, and I don't even want to. 
of the minor because there was a time where we did have that street, street protection. Mm-hmm. And, yes. and, and it was from those, it was from the Hello? street building, this, that, and the other. Hello? Oh, we got one? Okay. Yeah, we can. Hello? Hello? Yes. That's Robert Hart. Hello? Hello, Mr. Mr. Hart, you there? Yes, can you hear me? Yeah, we hear you. You live on the air. Um, yes, I just wanted to say amen, amen, amen to what Brother C.T. Jones just laid out and to what Sister Shanice Ali just said. <laughs> And capping it off, um, we need to do a lot of things on our our own. Being independent within the system, we have to police ourselves. And um, also, I want to thank Brother Mark in in paving the way um, to connect uh, Brother Professor Jones and. Um, I can't wait for for that opportunity. You guys hit hit the home run on this bar, this podcast. Excellent, excellent. I just had to say that before you guys uh, tune out. Thank you, thank Bob. you. Bless you. Appreciate you, beloved. Appreciate. You. Thank you. Um, it you know one of those things that um you spoke of, sis, and I and then this is it for me. But mm-hmm. when I looked at the origin of all of these different cultures, all of these different ethnicities, whether it was Irish, Italian, Jewish, Polish, whomever, when they got their starts in this country in particular, it all started from actually New York. It all started mm. from the bottom part of Manhattan. Mm-hmm. It all started from the five points. It all started with them being gangs. And it all started with them being gangs. And eventually the gangs would expand and expand into the point where they controlled territories. What Some of them controlled the docks. Some of them controlled the streets. Some of them controlled prostitution, whatever you want to call it. But they got their racket on somewhere. Some of them even became police officers and overseers. But what it is, is they took their street gang, organized it. And then we had organized crime. But Everything they got was founded in organized crime. And so mm-hmm. when we had people, even in um, uh, with, with Malcolm, there was times when he was given protection. His security was by Bumpy Johnson. Um, that was not just the, for the television show. That was real. <laughs> um, but and, and then other cities, even, you know, here in Philly, we there used to be a time when the gangsters, the people who were patrolling the streets or whatever, they themselves knew that they were doing so much damage. And I heard this specifically from one in particular that they said they, and their way of giving back was to put money into those particular um, grassroots organizations and also to provide security and protection to make sure wherever they go, they're safe. We did something a few years ago. The block by block black captains that was headed by my good brother BF and Krumah and another brother that I mentioned earlier, um, uh, brother Shamari. And one of the things we did is we took over a park in West Philly. And when we were in that park in West Philly for about five, six hours a day, one of the things they did was the the, the gangsters, whatever, they would bring their children to the park and they say, Y'all ain't got to worry about nothing in here while y'all down here. And that was That's just because sad. they respected what we were doing in the community, they recognized it. I mean, everybody has their vice or whatever they do. But at the end of the day, even though even the brothers and sisters who are caught up still want to see us win. Right. We, gotta, we you know, we just gotta be the ones to say, you know what? Let's let's shove away the fear, the fear of working together and the fear of success and the fear of power. And let's see what it looks like when we start building it. Let's put aside our egos, our rugged individualism. Let's get our mental health in order so that we can understand when we should push up, when we should back off, and how we can move and move and shape this together. You know what I'm saying? I don't. I'm. A, I don't care for the spotlight. I'm more than happy to let somebody else have it. Right. <laughs> work to get done. This stuff here is drama. I don't mm-hmm. want drama. I want mm-hmm. the work to get done. So. Right. So, um, so those are the things we're going to be working on in the next few, uh, like this calendar year is going to be the year where I can't speak on everything I'm doing, but you know, right now where my, where, where my office space, I have a heat press operation that's about to get started. Um, I'm looking to bring some young people up in here so that I can get them trained and, and turn it, this into their entrepreneurial experience. Um, working, trying to um, get with the kids, the, the younger children on the block so that little by little they can get nuggets and plants and seed, seeds and things of that nature. So, you know, it's ongoing all day. And shoot, this might not be the last book I have for this calendar year. I'm thinking about another one. <laughs> I know that's right. Well, you, listen, congratulations to everything that you're doing. 
Right. And, you know, let us know. We drive. We could come out to Philly. I mean, if I, we, let us know. You know, right. if our calendar, um, help, you know, is clear, we definitely come out there and support at the end of the day. And it's not just about, you know, the reason why my husband and I started up our Speak Your Mind podcast with the Ali's is because I felt like can't nobody and will nobody ever in their life disrespect us on their Zoom or their podcast. So we're mm-hmm. going to start up our own and we invite those, you know, who are like-minded and, 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 and you know, as you hear, people definitely come on, people will speak your mind, speak, th- speak their mind and we're doing excellent work. Um, let us know when you're having something, we would definitely come out and support at the end of the day. This What's going on in our society and our world is global, and we are global people, so we so, definitely support. So, my brother, Professor Carl Tone Jones, thank <laughs> you so much thank you. for being a part of the Speak Your Mind podcast with the Ali's and sharing your work and your experience and your knowledge and everything for the <laughs> Independence Day project that you put together and also. 2020 through the eyes of a social media revolutionary please seek out these works please don't let this brother's work be in vain we need this information to be spread through the community and we need the youth to go forward with this information that has been compiled by this brother salute you, my brother. salute um, salute all salute. around salutes all around and i definitely appreciate you know you working together this is Seeing this type of work is what we need. We need to see, you know, brothers and sisters who who, who have matured to the point where they uh, are utilizing and, and using their um, unify. You, you and yourself, you, what you're doing right now is the first step to black liberation, the family. Mm, and the fact right. that you know, y'all are building each other up and you can see the energy. I don't know if we are different rooms or what. <laughs> yeah, we see, are. <laughs> you can see the energy. It's like, but it's synthetic. <laughs> Is this a beautiful thing, and, I, and I'm thankful. And anytime you want to call me back, I'm here. Thank okay. you. Ooh, Thank you, brother. Salute. Thanks for coming out. Peace, brother. Peace. Peace. Wow. Okay. So, another great podcast. We had a definite, excellent, excellent guest today, and he definitely gave us some stuff to think about, some stuff to move forward with. Um, we like to say thank you for all those who participated in the podcast whether it's through um speaking in the chat or calling in we like to say salute to the brother mark mafee my uncle um uh, we like the to mayor say to <laughs> sheila turner hart for um for, for for writing in the chat we also like to say salute to my brother charles russell clink uh jason mitchell for um posting in the chat and also my brother my brother where you been at my brother anthony singfell who was doing great things in the inside and i think i'm pretty sure he's doing great things on the outside so i definitely want to have him here in the future also to let yesterday we we celebrated the um release of my beautiful queen's book i am phenomenal a collection of affirmations and quotes a, a journal book for all of the women out there please go out there and get this book this book is information that may be vital to you being introspective and changing your way of looking at certain things and looking at yourself and you know what you add on well self-reflection is everything self-care is everything um you know my sister and i we did this book together we do have some quotes our own personal quotes we did get quotes uh quote from Martin Luther king um a few other greats uh great people that was inspirational to our lives we we have some um information that you you're able to look at the quote we have some beautiful beautiful pictures um it, everything about the book is beautiful as soon as i showed one person she bought the book and i wasn't even ready to put the book on out there but the design the everything about the book is extremely well written um and i would like to shout out my sister kwanisha gatewood who Salute, yes who was a part of that uh, with me uh, we do we we are talking about a part two 
And tomorrow, once again, on Fuzz, I will be talking about healthy relationships and unhealthy relationships. What do that look like? You know, we always talk about unhealthy domestic violence, you know, child abuse and things of that nature. But we don't really know what a healthy relationship look like. What are we looking for? Um, So, yes, that will be tomorrow on Fuzz. So I thank you to Robert Hart and Bailey and Brother Haja, um, Brother Mark, Brother Reggie. Um, so many people that's going to be on um, to, for tomorrow's show. And this Saturday, I will be speaking with my family at a law school in Mecca about the immune system and the COVID-19 vaccine and demystifying and breaking down the ingredients and, you know, how they came up with these vaccines and what our immune system consists of and how we can build our immune system. We will touch on all of that this weekend at a law school in Mecca. Um, I definitely want to say salute to everybody that tuned in and thank you for continually tuning in. We will be here every Sunday at 1 p.m. You can um, subscribe to our channel on YouTube. That's Speak Your Mind Podcast with the Ali's. Subscribe to the channel and hit the notification bell. You can also catch us on the I Am Phenomenal Unlimited business page and on my page, um, The God I Be on Facebook. So with that, I say peace. Thank you for turning in, for tuning in, and salute to my brother, Professor Carl Tone Jones. Peace. Peace.